Hi, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you all to MS Live. This is a virtual series created by MS Views and News. Joining me today is Jennifer Falk, our Director of Development. Plus, of course, we have our two guests, Dr. Mary Hughes and Dr. Aaron Boster. So I want to give you a quickie introduction on the two doctors. Dr. Hughes completed her internship in neurology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. She was in her fellowship in electrophysiology at the Medical College of Georgia when she got the call that would change the focus of her personal and professional career. Her sister had developed double, double vision and was suspected of having a brain tumor. The good news was that she did not have a brain tumor, but the bad news was that she had multiple sclerosis. And because of this, Dr. Hughes began to focus her interest in learning about the disease. She has a lot more to say, but I'm going to continue on now with Dr. Aaron Boster. And Dr. Boster, we would like to welcome Dr. Aaron Boster, a multiple sclerosis neurologist practicing in Columbus, Ohio. He's the founder and president of the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis. Dr. Boster is a fierce patient advocate and educator, and many of you may be familiar with his presence on YouTube and other social media. Something else that I would like to say about both of these doctors, again, you heard that Dr. Mary Hughes has a family member with multiple sclerosis. But Dr. Boster has one as well. Dr. Ha Boster had an uncle with multiple, scler multiple sclerosis, sorry about that, which is why they are both so passionate for what they are doing with their professional careers. Today's program format, um, a lot of you don't know what we were about to do. And what I wanna say is that we have developed, last year we were doing a lot of programs around the country called roundtable events. Where the two, you know, we had two different clinicians sitting at an actual round table and they would have a discussion about specific topics that we gave to them. Now we're virtual, all right? So they're really not looking at each other, but they are. They're looking at each other on the screen, okay? And they're looking at you as well, all right? And so we've given them topics to talk about, and I'm going to make those announcements of these topics as we go through so that way everybody's clear. But they're going to speak about each of the different topics for like 10 minutes each or whatever they can come up with during that time. And then we're gonna open it up to Q&A. So what I wanna let you know is that on your screen, you have a button there that you can click for questions. And what I would like you to do is if you have any questions, please click that and type in what you've got, okay? Now we also fielded a lot of questions from outside. I mean, everybody that that is on here today does know they did receive the email that said that if you wanted to submit anything in advance, to please do so. So I now have six pages of questions and Jennifer has about another five or six pages of questions. So we're gonna try to get to as many of these questions as we can, okay? But we're definitely not gonna be able to answer or ask all these questions. So I apologize for that. But I, one of the things I do wanna let you know is that whether we're doing live programs or this virtual series that we're now having to, um, to do with everybody, the, the thing is, is that the doctors cannot ask answer a question that you ask about you personally okay so please generalize your question if need be but don't say i'm having this kind of situation or this is happening to me because they're not your doctor and even if they were your doctor they can't divulge to the rest of the world how they're treating you so you know again just keep it generalized so to start things off we're going to have three sessions we're going to be speaking about ms things for the first two sessions, all right? The third session is gonna get into a little bit more of what's going on in this day and age, all right? And then the very last topic that we're gonna discuss is COVID-19's effect on multiple sclerosis. So you can ask your questions as we go along, as you think about them, you know, ask them, um, type them in, we'll get to them during the different Q&A sessions. But the main part is, is that you just have to realize that um, everything to do with COVID-19, we're going to wait until the very end because that, I think, is going to take the most amount of time. So please bear with us. Please ask your questions. If you have to get up and use a restroom, go for it. OK, I can't. We're not going to stop the video. There is no time out. And by the way, for anybody that wants a refreshment, get to your refrigerator and go for it. OK, <laughs> just remember to share with us. OK, so first up, we're going to talk about making MS boring and MS disease progression. And Dr. Boster is going to begin, and then Dr. Mary Hughes is going to begin. And let's go for it, everybody. Let's have a great time this morning. Howdy. Mary, this is a fun way of having a chit-chat. 
Um, in, in some ways, I feel like we're participating in a virtual fireside chat. We just don't know who's watching. Um, I'm excited to share with you. And, you know, in keeping with this first topic, I'm asked a lot in clinic and abroad, hey, Dr. B, when's there going to be a cure? You know, when will we cure this disease? Mm -hmm. And I, I humbly suggest that in my lifetime, we're unlikely to cure the complexities of multiple sclerosis. But I think that with effort today, we can strive to make us born. You know, and I think about diabetes, you know, two generations ago, diabetes was a death sentence. You develop diabetes and ultimately you go into renal failure. And now you might not know that your girlfriend has MS unless you happen to eat chocolate, or, uh, has diabetes unless you eat chocolate cake with her. And, you know, she injects herself with a little insulin. And I'm not suggesting that it's easy to have an autoimmune disease, not at all. But I think in the modern era, we can strive to make MS boring, to let people live their most full life, the best version of them despite having the disease. And when I talk to patients, that's really my focus is how do we let you live your life and not let MS make decisions? It, does that resonate or, you know, what, what are your thoughts does, there? Sir. When you first said, when I first heard make MS boring, I had to stop and think about that. Um, and uh, and I, and I agree with you, this question of what is a cure? And what's really exciting is what we talk about, what we mean as a cure has continued to evolve. Um, we yes. now have treatments that decrease the likelihood someone have a relapse and people go years without relapse. Um, but we're not done yet. We're still talking about how do you impact the, the uh, how do you address the symptoms that affect day-to-day -day quality of life? Yes. 20 years ago, I didn't spend as much time talking about yoga. Uh, I didn't have time to talk about yoga. We were talking about what to do for relapses and, you know, um, side effect management of our medications. Uh, now we're starting to push, you know, well, what would a cure mean? A cure would be no more relapses, no more progression, but also how do we fix the damage that's been done? Amen. And the, where, we are come, where we've come in 20 years has been really remarkable. We've got a long way to go. But I, I agree with you. We have now and the it's focus that we can have. Um, people's eyes kind of glaze over when you say, are you exercising, right? Uh, and, you know, every doctor's visit, doesn't matter what you're there for, says, are you exercising? The joy of it is we have time to focus and we recognize how important that is. And so I am not an athlete. I find exercise boring, except for when I see what a remarkable impact it has. I can tell who my patients are who exercise. They don't need to tell me. I know who's exercising. I know who's not. You know, I, I have um, coined this uh, phrase that I want my patients to be four for four in their fight against MS. Right. And I want to run it by you and, and kind of get your impressions because I, I, I want to encapsulate four things that I'm aware of that can slow down multiple sclerosis, that can empower a person impacted by MS to take charge and to help make MS boring. So when I'm talking about being four for four in your fight against MS, the, the four things are, number one, to exercise as part of your lifestyle. Now, I am also not a professional athlete. Um, and a lot of times, just like every other red-blooded American, I come home, I'm tired. And yet, as you point out, we know that people impacted by MS who exercise as part of their lifestyle get less disabled. When you look out 20 years, they have less cognitive impairment. They're walking. They're falling less. I mean, it's, it's a big deal. And so that number one, when being four for four, is to exercise as part of your lifestyle. Okay. Number two is to not smoke cigarettes. Okay. And we know that smoking cigarettes increases the risk to develop MS. Mm -hmm. And if you have MS, smoking cigarettes can speed it up. And some of the epidemiologic studies suggest almost by 50%. Mm -hmm. And yet stopping smoking can slow that back down. So when I think of being four for four, I think of exercising as part of our lifestyle and then not smoking tobacco. Number three for me is all about diet. And uh, Dr. Hughes, when I talk uh, about that, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a proponent of supplementing low levels of vitamin D. Now, mm -hmm. I don't I don't live in hot Atlanta and, you know, where there's beautiful sun a lot of times. And here in the Midwest, seven months out of the year, you know, we only look at sun and pictures, you know, because we don't see it. And so if we check a vitamin D and it's low, we'll supplement to drive that level up. You know, the the fourth, and I, I guess we could talk more about diet, but the fourth thing is to take a disease modifying therapy and make sure that it's working. And if you can exercise as part of your lifestyle, not use tobacco, supplement vitamin D and eat clean, 
and take an MS medicine to make sure it's working. In my mind, you are setting the stage for boring disease. What, what yes. do you think of my four for four? I, I love your four for four. I also know that we frequently step on people's toes, right? And so um, uh, when you talk about exercise, the biggest thing I hear is, well, I can't, right? I used to be, but I can't do this anymore. Yep. And so one of the things we're increasingly incorporating is, oh, yes, you can, right? And so I frequently recommend yoga uh, yep. off YouTube, right? Uh, yep. uh, the smoking, well, I mean, I don't know of a disease that smoking makes better. Right. The better you take care of the machine, I'm still looking for it. Um, the better you take care of the machine, the better people do. And that's yep. an important one. And I tell my patients, the day you come in and I don't ask if you've quit smoking, you need to fire me. Right? Yep. This isn't I'm not in the uh, oh, I feel so sorry for you. You have MS. You might as well smoke. <laughs> and yep. I think getting away from that perception. And there was data to, uh, early on that we forgot to talk about these wellness issues with our MS patients. Right. Um, simple things like, you know, well, just because you have MS doesn't mean you, mean you don't need mammograms. Um, so those exactly. recommendations, those wellness that are just as important for us to incorporate. Now, when you said diet, you know you opened up a, a kettle of worms or wherever worms come from. Um, and uh, which diet? Well, the basics, and I think we can certainly debate various diet approaches, um, but, uh, you know, if, there's more, if you can't understand what's on the box. Yes, you, yes, uh, preach. Uh, you know, it's just like you can't read it, if you, or if you need to sit down in a chair because there's so many ingredients, you don't need to be doing it. And that is exactly right. Right. Yeah, when I went off to college, I didn't know how spoiled I was. My mom was a nutritionist or is a nutritionist. And I oh, called my. her from college. I said, you're not going to believe this, mom, but food comes in boxes. And it was just such a revelation. Uh, and so going back to, well, what is it like to cook a green bean? Um, mm -hmm. You know, my son is now 20, but when he was 10, he came home and said, you know, we're talking about the gardening. And, and so we had to start, you know, trying to grow some green beans. His plant grew three. I bought more uh, from the grocery store, and he didn't want me to mix them. He wanted the homegrown. We knew what chemicals we didn't put on. We used to mark. And so going back to a lot of these basics, Americans eat too much, and I'm including myself among that. All right, I've strategically put the camera where you can't see how well I follow my own advice. Um, they eat too much. They eat too much meat, probably. All right. So cutting back on meat. You can go all the way and say no meat, or you can say less meat. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to eat more vegetables. Um, mm -hmm. Mom was right. Mom was definitely right with that. Um, and so getting back into the basics is something really. And then after that, it's just icing on the cake. How do you interpret that? You know, when, and, when, I, try, when I try to talk to a family about nutrition, I share your opinion that coming at them with 17, uh, 18 dogma rules, it, th that's not a recipe for success. But if, if we shoot for avoiding highly processed foods, yes. avoiding fast foods, mm -hmm. avoiding heavily sugar laden foods, and then to your point, if we avoid foods with ingredients that you can't pronounce, mm -hmm. I think we are well on our way to making awesome selections. Yeah. And you know, t to your point earlier, we could have a discussion about this diet or that diet or some of the data or lack of data that may or may not support it. But if your lunch has ingredients like chicken, mm -hmm. apple, celery, I think we're winning. Right. And so oftentimes I find that my patients, when I actually take a food history from them, they don't eat food. <laughs> they eat diet. No, they, I swear, they eat diet soda. Yes. They eat McDonald's cheeseburgers, which aren't actual food. And, mm -hmm. and that's what they're sustaining themselves on. Okay. And I, don't, I would love your impressions on this, but I've had so many anecdotal successes where someone cuts out sugar and they cut out processed foods and they don't need their energy medicine. Yes. You know, where they come back and they said, you know what, doc, I don't need a refill on my ProVigil. I feel so much better. I feel so much better. That's a big deal to me. Well, Aaron, so, one, so I always have to, I always, my patients know I try not to be a hypocrite and I tell them when I'm being a hypocrite. So when I ask them about exercising, I will confess I have an exercise recently and at your next visit, check on me. Right. I need that encouragement. Uh, at yep. one point, I realized my refrigerator had all the four food groups. I had Burger King. So hamburgers were covered. I had Pizza Hut. So pizza was covered. Chinese food. And I forgot what the fourth one. But we all know what the options are. And so a lot of times we need to think about 
Um, well, how do we adapt for that? Right. I'm busy. I'm tired. Um, so maybe meal prepping on the weekend, trying to come up with one or two meals that you can have in place when you cook, maybe cook enough for two meals. So you put one in the freezer so you don't have yep. to eat all week long, but you can Great switch it. And I think once you start getting into like new recipes, like how many ways can you cook carrots? It turns out there's more than you would think. Um, then you know, it's not that you have to cut out all salt, right? And when you compare to what you use when you're cooking at the house versus what's in a can of green beans, um, mm -hmm. you don't need to go to major extremes. And the food starts to taste so much better that yep. all of a sudden you're sitting out and you're going like, this was okay. But the food, you know, the dinner we had last night was really good. And so it's nice to make those, uh, you know, changes. I'm a moderate. There, uh, there is food in my cabinet that has boxes, um, but those are my emergency foods. Those are for the days when I just can't get to. Them. Um, and I think once you start to incorporate that lifestyle, you start to recognize how much better you feel, and then it's so much easier to continue. Th those are great, those are great tips, um, Stuart. Are there some questions out there surrounding this discussion on making MS boring? Um, there are a couple of questions so far, and then I, you know, we want to talk about that, and then we're going to get into disease progression also. But uh, one person wants to know right now, um, they're worried about the availability of their Tysabri infusion, and can you explain the rebound effect if they're not able to take that? Okay. And it's not just that one person. I wouldn't say it's just that one person. I've heard this from a lot of people, you know, with that same concern right now. Well, I think that's been a challenge in the clinics also. And so we do not recommend that people stop their Tysabri. That's an, now, I would always say that's broadly speaking, that's an individual um, decision with your provider. Some providers are maybe saying instead of every month, maybe every six weeks. Um, but what we've had to incorporate in our office is we don't infuse like we used to. Um, so we have six chairs and they're closer than six feet apart. So now we infuse two people at a time and they are six feet apart. My nurse wears uh, uh, a mask. Uh, we can't have anybody come in with you during your infusion. Uh, they'll have to stay outside of the office. Um, so we're making adaptions to continue to make that available to patients. And certainly the pharmaceutical companies have bent over backwards to reach out to us and say, if you have needs, if you have concerns about accessing these medications, please let us know. Aaron, have you done similar things? We, we, uh, we are thinking along the same lines. Um, we have uh, six infusion rooms that fortunately are private with doors. And we, um, we have a separate entrance for our infusion patients, which okay. segregates them um, a, a bit. And what we do with our nurses is bring the patient directly into the room, close the door. We can sanitize the rooms in between. Um, I agree with you that Tysabri is not one that we're gonna stop in most cases. Uh, I agree that going every six weeks um, feels a bit safer uh, just because there's less uh, trafficking uh, back and forth for infusions. Um, but I think we have to keep in mind this whole risk benefit right. because we didn't start Tysabri because it sounded fun. We started Tysabri because it was appropriate and needed to combat a, a rather not nice autoimmune condition that attacks the holiest of holies. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to reframe the risk benefit to highlight both. Yes, there is a risk to leaving one's home, et cetera, in this current era. And, and yes, there is a, a, a risk to getting an infusion maybe, but there's also a risk to not treating. And uh, we'll get into the details later, but I think mechanistically, Tysabri, amongst all the highly effective drugs, might have a leg up in this current environment. And maybe that's a, maybe that's a comment to come back to. Yeah, uh, I but Aaron, I think, you know what it speaks to? It speaks to your comment about making MS boring, right? Yes. And so yes. people are in this phase that they almost forget that what their MS was like. There's a reason why you're on these medications. And yep. so I found myself reminding folks, you know, you still have MS. And while we are concerned about risk of infections and else, we've got to balance those two and do everything we can make uh, to make um, you safe during this time. And I really like what you said. At the end of the day, this is an individualized decision. You and I can, you and I can come up with multiple hypotheticals, this mm -hmm. person, this age, these comorbid conditions, and we might, we might decide for that individual, the better part of valor is a different plan. Mm -hmm. uh, we could come up with a different set of variables and say, oh, this is, we're going to go in a different direction. And, and I think this is really the crux of clinical medicine. Um, you know, and that's why we're a team. 
you know, this is a team sport. And that's why we have to put our heads together with our families and our patients that we care for to figure out what is the right risk benefit balance. And I, and I want to make this point. I think this is very important to hear as they were not just pulling these things out of a hat. There's data around um, yeah, change that's a, that's a, used every six weeks. And one of the things that's been wonderful in the last couple of weeks is hearing from our colleagues across the country and internationally. And so there have been many groups, uh, whether it's it's uh, formal meetings, whether it's list servers, whether it's blogs, where it's Facebook posts of colleagues coming together and saying, well, how are you handling this and what are the pros yeah. and cons? Um, and so when these decisions are, or recommendations are being made, they are being made based on the best scientific uh, information that we can. Now, speaking of that, I know Stuart uh, would like us to kind of talk about MS progression. And right. So oh. if you hold off a moment, though, we have a lot of questions even to oh, we do. Okay. where you were. So for those so of you out there, here. Stuart gave us a very strict agenda, and he's thrown it out the window already. So you're, Stuart, you just got to be ready to flow. Okay, I'm ready. Let's do it. Jennifer. <laughs> I have some questions. So in relation to what you guys are speaking about in terms of infusion, there's a lot of fear right now in going in for my infusion. And people want to know, in addition to the safety changes that have been made, that the infusion centers have made adjustments, what can they do to protect themselves as an individual going in? What do you recommend to your patients? Mary, maybe we can take turns. You'll do one and I'll do one. You'll do one and I'll do one. And we'll just keep going until Stuart and Jen tell us we're not allowed. Um, do you want to start it off? I'm going to start because I've got my hand sanitizer right here. All right. Here and so your recommendations really aren't any different from anybody else's. And they're not any different from they are during the flu epidemic. Right. Um, exactly but we're right. paying attention to them in a way that we never paid attention before. You know, I started to worry is like, were people not washing their hands before? Where's this hand sort, you know, hand soap shortage? Should we have been thinking about, you know, when you go to gas, should you um, put a glove on? Should you hand sanitize? Um, I used to have it in my purse. Now I have a little thing hooked on the outside of my purse. So it's a mental reminder every single time, every yep. single time. Um, yep. Social distancing, right? You hear us speaking to that of how we're trying to protect people when they're in the office. Um, but understanding when we say, you know, your husband's going to have to sit in the car or we'll call him when you're done with your infusion, right? There's that discomfort for that. You know, we like having infusion suite. It's one big open space. And a lot of times I have to come over there and tell them to hold it down um, because people are getting a chance to interact with other people who have a mess and know their story. And it gets a little rowdy in there sometimes. But for right now, we're going to have to limit that. We're going to have to do that. And so paying attention to those recommendations, I think, are really, really important now. Right. Yep. You know, a couple other things to piggyback off that. Um, the, the, the concerns with infection have to deal with contracting the infection and then how severe the infection might be. People with MS are not at increased risk of contracting the infection just because they have MS. People getting an infusion aren't at increased risk of contracting an infection because they're getting an infusion. The, and the way that we mitigate contracting, the way that we mitigate uh, communal spread and try to flatten the curve is by these important measures. And these measures are true for every single person listening right now, whether you have MS or not. And so, you know, to, to piggyback off the idea of the hand washing or hand sanitizing or, and, and social distancing, there are other things. We don't want you touching your face as much. You know, one of the ways that we can track a virus is you touch a surface that has virus and then you touch your face, you adjust your glasses, you, you know, smooth out your beard, whatever it may be. And by touching your face, you can introduce virus. So just becoming cognizant of that and trying not to do that so much is a really important technique. Similarly, many of us in medicine are guilty of working sick. You know, there's a subculture in medicine that if you're sick, you be a big boy, you put on your big boy pants, you take some Tylenol and you get in there on the wards and you do it up. And if you were to stay home because you had a little cold, literally your colleagues would look down upon you and say, oh, you couldn't handle it. Well, that is the wrong uh, machoistic attitude to embrace any in general and specifically during flu season. And so if you're ill you have an opportunity to share that illness with the community. But if you're ill at home, you, by social distancing and by keeping yourself out of the fray, 
then you don't give the community an opportunity and, and, and you'll clear that virus at home and it will die. And so, uh, so just using common sense, if you're feeling, if you're feeling punky, don't push on, you want to keep yourself at home. That's another really important technique. Okay. Next question. Person asks uh, that exercise is important. What recommendation do you have for those when exercise causes symptoms like tingling and do um, exercise through, do you still exercise even still through a flare? That's a, that's a, that's a great question. Maybe I'll, I'll start off. Um, then I'm really curious to hear what Dr. Hughes has to say. Um, it's important to understand the concept of heat sensitivity uh, and um, heat-related symptoms when considering exercise. I'm reminded of a young lady that had a, a, um, an addiction to running. And I don't know why she was addicted to running, but she loved to run. And, and I would talk to her about how gross I thought that was, and she didn't care. She was a runner. She had MS, and she developed a, a spinal cord syndrome where her leg was numb. And, and she could feel it a bit, but she really couldn't feel her leg very well. And she thought that she had to stop running because when she would run, her leg would become really numb and, and she, couldn't, she couldn't feel it at all. And so and she was profoundly depressed because of this running addiction that she had. When I explained to her that she couldn't make her, her, her MS worse, she could run her butt off, her leg could go numb, and as soon as her body cooled back down, her leg would re retain the feeling that she had preserved. She made one small adjustment. She dropped her head about 15 degrees. So out of the corner of her eye, she could see her foot. So she knew where to place her foot. And she ran a marathon that way. Now, I talked to her about it afterwards. Her, she said, I couldn't feel my leg the last 10 miles. I couldn't feel it, but I knew where it was. And so she was able to run. And my point here is if she didn't know about heat sensitivity, she might think that she was hurting herself and she might shy away. So I'm not, um, I'm not saying to ignore symptoms, but I am saying that having an understanding of that phenomenon so that you're not frightened is one step in the right direction. And so, you know, once upon a time, I mean, we've done this experiment, uh, well, before my time and definitely before Aaron's time, but when people got diagnosed with MS, they were told don't exercise. Oh, God and, forbid. And, and, this, and patients actually occasionally, actually not quite often, are smarter than their doctors. And there were very uh, important patients who said, you know, if I sit down, I'm going to die. And now we're talking about wellness as part of your treatment plan and how important that is. And so we do want you to continue to exercise. And I think that key, understanding you can't hurt yourself, right? Use your common sense. We may have to adapt that. In the South, we spend a lot of time talking about ice, ice baby. Um, so cooling, cooling vests, cooling ties. Once upon a time, you had to have like a special order. But now you, it turns out nobody likes being overheated. You can go to Walmart and find these cooling ties, the Frogger ties. You go to Lowe's in the middle of the summertime and there's all these cooling. There's ice chips. There's all these things that can be done um, to help yourself stay cool while you're exercising and try to mitigate some of those worsening of your underlying symptoms. But the key is that you're not hurting yourself. Um, you can't make your MS worse by exercising. Um, so we may need to adapt that. Now, for people during a flare, and I think that was part of the question. Um, so during a flare, depending on what symptoms you're having, uh, you may need to adapt that. But also, when I'm in the middle of not feeling well, I don't generally continue to do my same exercise regimen. I allow my body to heal. And I think not unlike your woman who was addicted to running, I had a woman who, um, instead of 10,000 steps, her average was 30,000 steps a day. Woo! And she kept talking about how her knee was hurting. I'm like, I don't think a knee is meant to go 30,000 steps a day. And so what we had to do was to kind of mitigate, yes, exercise is wonderful, but there is such thing as too much exercise, right? And I love hearing that because I'm not in any danger of that, but I love just in case I need to know this information down the road. But there is a such thing as too much exercise. And so when you're not feeling well, uh, give yourself a break. OK, it's also that if you take a day or two, um, maybe you do half your regimen. Maybe you just do your stretching exercises, you know, but I don't feel like people have to feel like, you know, yes, I've had a flare, but I'm going to power through this. I agree. 
We don't want MS to get you, but it's okay sometimes to sit down for a few minutes and rest and then come back. You, you highlight a really important point. Sometimes uh, my patients will share they feel guilty because mm -hmm. they're resting. And I have to remind them, you're not being lazy or ignoring. You're doing exactly what your body needs. Right. Now, sometimes it's harder to not do something than to do something, or at least emotionally. And I think you made that point very lovely that during a flare, it might not be the, the best time to push it. You may need to let your body heal and recover. Um, right. One idea I did want to run by you, something that I oftentimes recommend people consider most red-blooded Americans somewhere in their house have a piece of equipment that they bought seven to 10 years ago. <laughs> and it's used, it's used to hold uh, clothes, you know, like, like mm -hmm. extra ties, underpants, et cetera. And right. So what I typically do is I ask, where's the treadmill? Where's the stationary bike? And they'll say in the second bedroom or in the basement gym that I've never been to, and then I ask them to do something that is not very feng shui. I ask them to move the elliptical into the living room where the television is located. Because most of us decompress in the evenings in front of the boob tube. And we may spend two hours, you know, between, let's say, 9 and 11, just kind of staring at the television. So if you have your treadmill within visual um, observation of the TV, something very interesting happens. And you, you start to think about it. And what I challenge my, my, my families to do is, during a commercial, somebody in the room gets on the treadmill. Now, just for the duration of the commercial. So, you know, that's every 15 minutes for about three minutes, somebody needs to be on that, uh, on that treadmill. It doesn't have to be the person impacted by MS, but somebody in that room needs to get on that bad boy. And if you watch TV for two hours in the evening and you got on for three minutes every 15 minutes, you would actually sneak a workout in while you were watching Tiger King. And, <laughs> and I think it's a, it's a clever way of, of, of entering into a workout without yeah. having to carve out time. I, what, what do you, I mean, are you buying what I'm selling? I watched Tiger King last night and <laughs> um, I was not on my treadmill, but I should have been. And actually, that's one of the things I do is encourage people to put it in front of a TV. All right. For those of us that the time on a treadmill I don't get a second wind. It feels like I've been on there forever. But let me be watching something on TV. And next thing I know, because, you know, Netflix only gives you that 10 seconds. Do you want to watch? You hadn't even thought about it. Then you're into the next one. If I'm on the treadmill during that time, I continue. And so I think yeah. that's a great trip. Great trip. I have, I have to interrupt you both right now. We have so many questions to go through. and We still have a lot of topics to do. I'm going to ask you both that per question, you get 30 seconds to answer. That's it. All right. So we got to go. We have we have we have 100 questions. I've never talked for 30 seconds and that's it in my life, Stuart. But okay, have you ever done 28? Have you ever done 28? <laughs> Stuart's in charge of the camera. So if I start blinking out, you know what happened. All right, Stuart. So do you want to take a question or do you want to go on to MS progression? We have a couple of more questions to ask. Jennifer is about to ask one. Um, okay. Then we're going to get into the progression. Then we'll ask a few more that have come up and then we'll get into the next subject. Okay. okay. So let Jennifer go and then uh, 30 seconds each on your responses, please. And, and then we'll, good. yeah. And then, and then we'll start to, and then we'll start the progression. Okay. Okay. So you guys touched on nutrition. Uh, I was getting hungry listening to this, but somebody's asking, uh, about diet and if there's evidence between dairy and MS flare-ups, is there, is there recommendations that you all have in regards to incorporating dairy, taking out dairy, any gluten-free, things that you know that there's evidence that there may be improvement or not? So I'm, there and I'll I'm a middle of the road person. I have tried lots of diets in my life and they didn't last. And if it's a diet that tells me that I have to take out all gluten, and I physically don't need to take out gluten, I'm never gonna stay on it. And so I'm, I, what I encourage is more of an elimination diet. So if you're, going to, if you're worried about how dairy affects you, then take dairy out of your diet for a while. And if you don't notice a benefit, put it back in. If, you, if you're worried about gluten, take it out for a while. And then if it doesn't affect you, put it back in. Um, but I am also recognizing that once you develop this diet, whatever your appropriate diet is, we want you to stay on it for long periods of time. 
And I take a lot of joy out of eating. And I think in order to be able to maintain that long term, you've got to come up with something that's workable. Yes. Um, I'll use, I'll bank some time and simply say what she said. There you go. That's, That's cool. Good. That's cool. Okay. All right, so, so, you know, again, there are a lot of people that joined in late. I just want to let them know that we're going through a series of different questions. I mean, different topics relating to multiple sclerosis first. All right. And then we're going to get into the last topics of the, of this program are going to be about COVID and multiple sclerosis. So if you have any questions and if you just joined in with us, Please use the question tab that's found on the screen. Write out your questions, all right? And we'll hopefully get to them later on, all right, as the different topics come up, all right? So in the meantime, I want to let the doctors now talk with each other about uh, MS disease progression. You're on. So, you know, Mary, one of the things that I'm struck by as it relates to the concept of progression, and, and I wonder if you experience this with your patients in clinic, is a misunderstanding of, uh, of what progression is and means. And a, a lot of patients would say, please don't tell me I have secondary progressive MS as if that was a stage four cancer diagnosis, right. as if now it's time to hang crepe and make sure that the insurance policy is in place and you know get your affairs in order. The reality is that there are aspects of progressive neurological decline from day zero in MS, a lot of people don't like to talk about that, but that's a fact. And the, 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 the things that we're talking about doing, not smoking, brain health, exercise, diet, disease-modifying therapies, particularly some of the newer disease-modifying therapies, impact progression. Mm -hmm. In the modern era, I'm not trying to sell snake oil and tell you that we can stop it forever, but we can slow progression with some of our medicines and with some of our efforts then I personally find that empowering. I mean, what, what is your take? So I think we've always tried to manage secondary progressive, right? But we were careful not to say that because we didn't have any FDA approved medications for secondary progressive MS. And so when patients heard that, they also heard, wait a minute, all the FDA approved medicines are for relapsing forms or relapsing remitting MS. Um, and uh, so we, we focused a lot on you know, function. How can we increase your function? Is it time to go to back to PT? Is it a time to look at an adaptive device? And we tried. We tried hard um, to use medicines, and I think I can say here off-label, uh, to try to address that. But in the last couple of years, what we've seen is options come, right? And so all of a sudden, it's not a dirty word. It's basically saying we may need to readdress what your treatment options are. All right. Maybe you haven't been on a treatment for a long time. Is this the time to reconsider it? If you've been on something and you're noticing a change, then maybe that's something that we need to talk about. Yeah. Um, I think that's a very empowering place to be. But it's also uh, speaking to how we progress and being able to care for people with MS yeah. um, and understanding. Now, for a long time, I think we've kind of known that if we got people to a certain level of disability, no matter how hard we try. We couldn't change that trajectory. That message has to change now, now that we have new treatment options. And yes, they're expensive. And yes, they're, you know, there's lots of concerns about this, but that's an individual decision. Now, I'm going to throw one back to you because here's one I don't like, is that there are people who will say, well, once somebody hits 65, they're unlikely to be having relapses. Now, um, I'm not in my 60s yet, but my husband is. And I think if I told him, well, you're 60, you know, and yeah, you lived a good life. We're just going to step back from your MS. I would have to find a new home. And so this, this idea that at some point we said, you lived enough. We need to back off from you. Okay. And I think that is a message that, um, that breaks my heart. Um, we know that, yes, some people can successfully stop medications, but I can't predict that. And by the time I know who can't, and I think as we start asking the questions about how's your cognition, how's your dexterity, as we start to ask people about questions that we didn't spend a lot of time, we understood that people with MS might become more forgetful, not demented, but more problems with attention and concentration. We sort of accepted that. But when I send my husband to the grocery store, I want him to remember the grocery list. I'm not going to say, well, you're in your 60s. I mean, you know, I always tell, I'll tell you when you get old. I'm a neurologist, you know. We know old when we see old. 
And then even this concept of the young old and the old old. Um, so that conversation about is it time to reassess? And then recognizing, you know, and really speaking to our patients, this is a partnership. All right. If I need you and your care, your loved ones to tell me about what are the changes that they're noticing. If we're not honest with each other in the office, then I'm working with half a piece of you know, equipment and I may not address these issues and you may not know that things have changed. And right. so, yes, there are changes from the very beginning and maybe even before we know that a person has MS. Right. But that doesn't mean that in this day and age that we can throw our hands up, go, yeah, you turned 65, you know, it was a good run, um, live out your next 25 years the best you can do. Dr. Hughes, I 100% agree with you. I'm actually, um, I get emotionally upset when I hear about this plague that is uh, an, uh, affecting neurologists. It's a disease that where they think that because someone reaches a chronologic age that, they, that they're done treating. Um, and it's ageist. You know, it's, it's, it's downright rude. I have, I have patients who are active 70 year olds. They're killing it. They're right. working full time. They're, They're out serving, <laughs> serving their community. They are, they are leaders in their families and in, in, in active lives. And maybe the reason they're doing so well is because we got it right. You know, I have high cholesterol. So thanks dad. And you know, when I reach a certain age, do I say, well, now it's okay to have a heart attack. You know, I had a good run of it. I didn't have a heart attack yet. So now I don't need my statin, you know, anymore. I don't think so. And well, if, 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 point, no, if I think this, have, this is an important point that I want to come up with is that you don't want me treating your diabetes. I would treat it like I did when I was in medical school 27 years ago. All right. And one of the things I think we have to recognize is not all neurologists are on the same playing field. And if I treated MS like I treated it when I came out of residency, then there would only be one drug that I'd be using today. And so making sure that you are with the provider that is well informed about the treatment options. All right. I think if you, you know, uh, one day last week we had a new drug approved. Now, I don't yep. think you gave me a 15 minute warning. Said, did you hear about this? But if you come in and there's, you know, you do your research, and that's one of the things that's wonderful about people with MS, is they yes. do their research, right? Yes. Um, yes. And so uh, bringing this information and, and making sure that your provider, and you should hold their feet to the fire, is as least as well informed as you are, and hopefully much more informed. All right. And so, I, yes, the, the playing field has changed. There are new options, but I think that's part of your onus is to take part of that and say, you know, my doctor never even heard of that drug. Now, if it got approved 10 minutes ago, fair, all right? Uh, but if it's something that's been around for a longer period of time, they say, I never used that before. I don't really feel comfortable with that drug. You well, may want to talk that to somebody who has used these medications and who is comfortable with this. You think about the partnership, Dr. Hughes, the, the, the patient knows themselves better than anyone else because they're with themselves all the time. They are a self-expert. You know, you and I aren't smarter than them we read different books than they read. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is we bring to the table a base of knowledge that we can then try to apply as a team. And the onus is on us as so-called MS specialists to stay current. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think that that's fair. And I assume that my patients want me to stay up on what's going on. And that's part of what I bring to the table. You know, and, and it's a two-way street. It's an intimate relationship, let's be honest. You talked about being honest with your provider. It's not my MS. You know, if you if you want to smoke cigarettes, for example, I'm not mad at you, but it's my obligation to tell you that's going to make you feel worse faster. Well, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that's on them. That's their body. That's their brain. But if nothing else, I can share how sad I am about what might happen. I mean, at the end of the day, we, we want people to come to the table as informed and as charged up and as ready to work as partners as possible. Um, and, and I think that you are allowed to hold your MS doc to the fire and say, what, what about this? Be. Have you, you thought about this? Yeah. And actually, so, I actually like that. Uh -huh. So, okay. We're both actually, so All right. So the next thing is uh, what I'm surprised by is people who are not sure whether they've had a relapse or whether they are, or whether they're progressing and are not really sure of that. Um, what's a relapse? 
Um, what, how do I know if I'm progressing? And I think those are part of that education campaign that really has to be front and center. Not only mm-hmm. some of the MS magazines that are starting to really talk about this. MS News and Reviews has been wonderful about talking about the different phases. How do you know if you're progressing? What are things are normal and what is not normal? And when patients will say, well, you know, I'm, um, I'm not getting around like I'm used to, but I'm old. I'm like, I'll tell you when you get old, right? Um, neurologists are pretty hard on that old conversation. And so, or, you know, I'm a little bit more forgetful than I used to be. And then it's not always your MS. Um, and I think that's the other thing is that as we age, I'm aging, um, you know, the likelihood of thyroid disease, which can affect your energy levels, the likelihood of sleep disorders, you know, obstructive sleep apnea will affect your fatigue, will affect your cognition. So we need to have that conversation so we can look to make sure that there's not something else going on that you're perceiving. I think back to a patient who was uh, weeks away from his 40th birthday and what came in and he was just he, he was he was tired. His MS was horrible. Things were awful. Um, and, I, and I mean, I he was on a good treatment. What was changing? What had happened? Turns out he was a new diagnosis of diabetes. I've never been so happy to hear about diabetes in my life. Right. Because diabetes is treatable. And yep. so we have to recognize that before we can say, yes, this is your MS progressing, that there may be something out of medical that we need to address. And that's right. and that's a problem because sometimes healthcare providers kind of defer everything to your MS, right? And I'm always right. like, well, MS can do just about anything, but I don't know if it can do that, right? And then we have to kind of go back with that. So I think that it's okay to bring up the conversation. We are now bringing up that conversation, I think, in a much more aggressive way because we're excited, we are motivated, uh, we're energized by our new treatment options and our approaches and the new information that's coming out about the impact that we can have on progression. But let's not forget that just because you have MS doesn't mean you can't have thyroid disease. In fact, you have a higher risk for it. Just because you have MS doesn't mean you won't get diabetes. Just because you have MS doesn't mean you don't get a mammogram or a colonostomy. So a colon, whatever they call it, test. Um, um, so that we need to make sure we're taking care of all of you. And that's what's unique, I think, with um, MS specialists. And what, you know, we could debate what's an MS specialist. I would say that someone who is very interested in MS um, does the additional work to stay updated with a field that is so excitingly rapidly changing um, and is listening to you and available to you. And I think those are the things, um, uh, I think, Erin, I know you did a fellowship in neuroimmunology. I, I did it, what I call the fellowship at the feet of the giants. And so uh, when I got interested in MS, I stalked folks. And so I would go to a meeting and I would just say, those are the experts in the room. And I would sit down and I'd listen hard. And eventually they'd look over and go like, she keeps showing up. And I would just <laughs> listen and learn. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't necessarily think it has to be a specific degree. But you, when you're talking to somebody who knows what they're talking about, uh, you usually know. All right, no, Stuart before, has up on the before screen. Stuart, before Stuart makes us shift gears, I just wanted to piggyback off one thing that you said. You know, my late mentor uh, was, was very fond of saying, sometimes nature is a little too generous. Mm-hmm. And you can have MS and you can have another comorbid condition. And to your point, when someone tells me uh, that they're having a difficulty, we need to be open-minded because that might not, and I'll use fatigue as an example. Maybe it's a B12 deficiency. Maybe it's untreated depression. Maybe it's restless leg syndrome or the fact that they're getting up five times a night to pee. And we can make the outcome better. We can make the MS boring. We can make that fatigue in this example better, not by magically fixing the MS, but by addressing the comorbid things that are going on. And, and that's why this partnership is so important, where we have to come to the table armed with information about how to do that. And they have to come to the table with the willingness to be open uh, about what's going on. All right. Sorry, Stuart. You're good. You're good. So the first question I have about disease progression is person wants to know if there is uh, still ongoing progression, even if the MRI does not show it. And even if there are no new symptoms. Yes. Uh- who wants to go the, first? Uh, Throw um, a point. Uh, uh, go. 
Um, I'll go. <laughs> so, so the answer is yes. Uh, when we, uh, when, when Dr. Hughes and I look at an MRI of the brain, and we look at a part of the brain that appears normal, we call that normal appearing white matter or normal appearing gray matter. Because on the conventional MRI, it looks normal, but we know it's not. If you use non-conventional imaging techniques, fancy pants stuff to look at the metabolic activity or the flow of water or the, the thickness of the myelin, we can find that the areas that are normal appearing are actually impaired. And when, when, you, when you understand concepts of functional reserve and when you understand that the, the MRI is just taking a picture of structure, not function, it helps kind of fill in these gaps where you can say, well, my scan was okay, so why am I still having problems? And I'll just give a very, very quick analogy that I like to share with patients. And Dr. Hughes, I would love your input on this. I, I give an example and I want to come, I don't own a firearm, all right? I'm not a gun guy, but hypothetically, if I had a shotgun, okay, and I blew a hole in the wall of my living room mm -hmm. and my wife carted me off to prison, but didn't fix the wall. Now there's a hole in the wall and we just <laughs> left it there, right? Now yeah. let's fast forward 20 years where the structure of my home is aging. Which wall in the house falls first? Mm -hmm. The wall with structural damage from the shotgun when I lost my go rang mine, right? And mm -hmm. so my, my point here is, as we accrue neurological structural damage, we can pay the devil's price 15 years later as the brain ages. And that's not gonna be picked up on the MRI. That's not an attack. Because the reality is, is that MS is much more complex than we originally kind of discussed it in the 90s. I, I just, what do you think of it? And I'm not promoting gun violence, by the way. So I own a gun and it is locked in the gun cabinet. Um, and I only shoot at shooting ranges. Um, but maybe my husband should worry about holes in the walls. But anyway, so, <laughs> uh, but I, so I want to answer the question, a yes and a no, right? So if my MRI is not changing, can I still, Aaron did a wonderful job of going through that. If I'm not changing, am I having progression? By definition, if you're not changing, you're not progressing. But what we have to do is go back and make sure we're asking the right questions about what is progression. So yes. we've started screening people's cognition in the office. Um, we're not doing the dementia test because people with MS, well, if they live long enough, yeah, they have the same risk for dementia as anybody else. Um, but we're looking at cognitive agility. Um, so sometimes it's subtle things that may be changing and we may need somebody else to come in and say, yeah, no, it takes them a little longer to do X, Y, or Z, or we're concerned about, you know, maybe my hand dexterity is, um, a little bit different. Maybe my boss is like, you know, uh, I'm taking a little longer to finish a task at work. And so we need to have those open them to come. All those can be symptoms of progression. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody's rock solid stable and I've asked every single question I can think of, then no, they're not progressing. And I think it's important to say that while a majority and unfortunately a vast majority of people will have to deal with progression as part of their disease process. There are people who do not. And so we, we're not saying treat everybody as though they are progressing, but we also have that heightened awareness, that proactive approach about making sure we're treating their MS aggressively and appropriately early, early, um, so that we don't have as many challenges down the road. Yep. Okay. okay. Thank you. I have a question from Jan. She's uh, saying she's 60 year old female with primary progressive MS. I'm am I considered higher risk or immunocompromised just because of my age? So I would say her age is not enough. Does she have diabetes? Does she have heart disease? Um, what kind of physical health is she in? Those are, I think, the biggest concerns about risk with getting COVID. Now, there's, um, we know that we're hearing that there are younger people who are getting affected and that this, it's, maybe there's a changing face of it. But the most important thing is, is not just having primary progressive MS, but I would need to know more about her general state of wellness. And I don't really care if that's primary progressive or relapsing remitting or secondary progressive or any of the four of us on the screen. Um, your general wellness is more than most likely what's gonna have the biggest impact on your risk for getting complications from COVID. Yeah. 
Thank and you. at the risk of, of delving into a, a COVID discussion, there are certain risk factors that we've become aware of as a global community, which would place a given individual at being at higher risk of a more severe uh, disease course if they got COVID. And one of those risk factors is age over 60. Now, to Dr. Hughes's point, that's not um, a binary, oh, well, you know, then you're going to explode. Then if you're under 60, then, oh, you're perfect. It's one factor that we've discovered. Now, I remind us that we can't change if we're 60, but we can change a lot of the other factors that Dr. Hughes talked about. Uh, and as we game out risk benefit with patients, well, sure, I take into consideration if you're over or under 60, but there are so many other factors that are germane to that decision, um, as, you, as you point out. Great, thank you, so great advice. Thank you. There's a question um, from a person that uh, wants to know, what medications are there to slow disease progression? So I thought we were giving marching orders not to name specific That's drugs. That's right. That's right. Okay. So we'll, what is the answer to that? And, I, and actually, I think that's okay because in the general setting, the important thing is to know there are options. All right. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is we can't, the, how do you evaluate between the different options is so individual specific. It's a history of their disease. It's a history of their prior medical conditions. It's their family history. It's also their risk benefit ratio. And so people, I have people who come to me and say, I'll do anything you tell me to do. And I go, oh, don't say that, right? Because you don't know me that well, I might be nuts. And then you may end up on something that's just totally, you know, no science behind it. What we want to do is um, know that people have options, know that the options, um, uh, there's more than one option, but we can't put, um, you know, say, well, this one is for this type of person and this one is this to this type of person. I think that has to be part of a much larger conversation. So if the, if the question was coming out of, I didn't know there were options, then certainly they're a great resource. I'm sure you've covered this on MS News and Reviews. I'm sure the National MS Society has it on their website. I mean, there's a lot of information out there. Uh, and there's good information on the websites. Now, I'm always cautious about where I tell people to get their information from. And I've just named two of the places that I do recommend. Um, I have nothing against angels. But if you go to a website and there's angels flying by, that may not be the basis of the best medical information. All right. Um, I certainly uh, appreciate that you know somebody who knew somebody who took a drug. But that may not be the base, best base of information. Um, so I think that's part of becoming informed. Uh, I appreciate that you're on this conference call today because I think this is one of the reasons why both Aaron and I get up on a beautiful Saturday and I drove into the office. I don't know where he is, but I drove into the office um, and I put on my makeup on a Saturday morning um, so that we could have this conversation so that people could be better informed so that we can help grow these tools. As much as I enjoy Stuart's uh, company, there's another more important reason why I'm here today, and that's so that we can bring an awareness to the changes, hopefully arm those listening with tools. If you go home today or you're already home, if you turn off your computer later today and you know something that you didn't know before you signed on, then we have done our job. And that's why we're here today. Thank that's you. exactly right. You know, we're hopeful that we can energize, that we can empower, and most importantly, that we can educate. And as it relates to this particular question, being on a disease modifying therapy is the first step. Right. And if that drug is working or not working for you, is something you're going to sort out with your MS team. And if it's not working for you, even if it's supposed to be the best or what have you, then it's not working for you. And so then you're going to try to find a different drug. And the, the beauty of practicing in 2020 is that we have over 18 different formulations of drugs to choose from. And so I doubt you that, that Dr. Hughes has failed in finding something for someone unless they refuse. And so the answer is not, oh, we'll make sure it's this particular drug because that's nonsensical. It's trying to find the right drug that you can tolerate that's safe for you where we see the response we want. And I always like to remind patients, we don't marry our MS drugs, we date them. 
And if that drug is a gentleman, if that drug is a good dancer, maybe a very nice kisser, if that if that drug gets along with your family and he goes to church with you, then you're going to keep on keeping on in that relationship. But if that drug starts to step out and come home and smell like alcohol and, and maybe uses foul language and is not getting along with your parents, you may have to delete that drug off Facebook and you may have to take that drug out of your cell phone and tell that drug, honey, it's not you, it's me. I'm working on some things and then never call that drug back. And, and we're going to have to find a different drug to date because the goal is not the drug. The goal is making MS boring. And we embrace that conversation with you. That is what we do. You know, and, and you're right. Now, I didn't put on any makeup this morning. I'm going to come. I'm going to come clean. But I did shower, <laughs> um, you know, and, and I didn't make it to the office. So I'm, I'm in my living room. But, uh, you know, we'll just keep on keep it on. Very good. Can we move into the next uh, set of topics, please? Let's do, okay. it, do it. All right. Great. So um, we're, we're speaking about brain health, brain health and understanding MS today as long as well as mental health and MS, understanding the prevalence and recognizing when to discuss this topic with your healthcare provider. So if you guys can speak about this for a few minutes and then we'll take on a few more questions and then we'll get into the next set. Dr. Hughes, would you mind starting off? Yeah, so I'm gonna take the second one first, mental health and MS. Mm -hmm. And I can say that yes, there are issues that are maybe unique to MS. How do you live with a disease that's unpredictable? How do you cope with a new diagnosis? But the reality is, is mental health is a huge issue, um, whether we're talking about uh, in the general population. And so just like we've started screening for um, cognition, in our clinic. We've also started screening everybody for depression and anxiety. And, you know, depression, anxiety on TV, you know, the woman throws herself across the couch and she says, woe is me, woe is me. And then, you know, the man goes out and he, he's on his own and he chops wood in the woods or something like that. That's what it looks like on TV. But what it looks like in real life is when I ask somebody, tell me something you've done that you really enjoyed and you can't answer me, right? And you and life just feels blah. And maybe it's you're so tired and, you, and you're sleeping more and more hours. Is that my MS or is that depression? What we have to get away from in this society is that is, is thinking of depression as a sign of weakness. Thinking of anxiety as a sign of weakness. We don't walk up to a diabetic and just say, well, you know, just suck it up and uh, you know, tell a joke and you'll be okay, right? There is certainly a role for both counseling and medication. And then the point I make out to my patients is that, yes, medications can be effective. And for patients, I don't want to be on a medication. I say, well, you know, I tell a diabetic, don't eat cake. But if their blood sugars are still high and they're not eating cake, well, they're getting insulin or whatever they do for diabetes nowadays, okay? I watch TV and see the commercials like you do. Um, but if you just say, well, I just want to do, uh, I just want, just give me a pill and I don't want to talk about stress management and I don't want to go for counseling and I don't want to deal with the issues that are contributing to my depression, then don't call me and say, I don't know why this pill's not working. It's not doing everything it needs to do. Um, I think if we just look outside today, the anxiety levels are high, right? Um, and that's, that's human. I hate to tell patients, I'm like, you know, you think you got MS and you get a pass on all these other things. But depression and anxiety are very common. 80% of women will have at least one episode of depression uh, in their lifetime. You know, I usually joke and say, and we know what his name is. But, um, but there are a lot of um, there's, uh, you know, my baby was getting ready to go to college. I probably should have been hospitalized. And then he turned around and came back. Now I really need to be hospitalized. Um, but it was just like speaking to different transitions in your life. It's part of the wellness, the general wellness. If we did the first part, if we did four on four, four by four, um, yep. if we could have gave that three on three to every American, every person in the world. Diet, exercise, quit smoking, right? Yep. You're, you're, you're spot on. You know, it's on there. I, I like to share with patients that I'm clinically depressed, that mm -hmm. I take an antidepressant, that I see a counselor and I exercise. Mm -hmm. And I'm not ashamed of that. In fact, I'm proud of that because 
I am very successful and, and I have a good quality of life because of those efforts. You know, I'm also a boy, which means every once in a while I stop taking my antidepressant, you know, and then a couple of weeks later, I just feel horrible. And it's like there's a gray cloud over my life. And I'll, I'll tell you a quick anecdote. I called one of my close friends who's a clinician in a neighboring state. And I said, you know, something's wrong. I'm not I'm not doing well. I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm crying when I don't want to be crying and, and nothing seems fun. And she said, hey, dummy, did you stop your medicine? And I said, <laughs> Again, yes. right? Again. It, it, it hung up on me. Right. Because that's love. You know, um, I, I'm I, I think that you we need to normalize, not stigmatize mental health. Right. And, you know, I, I'm struck that both of us screen patients. Similarly, every patient that comes in the clinic, uh, we do a we do a patient reported outcome battery where we ask them questions before they come in on energy levels and mm -hmm. on mood and integrated into the conversation are our questions to to game out energy levels and mood and just like you pointed out we screen everyone with a, a cognitive test when they come in in addition to that you know we use the symbol digit modality um and and these are these are key things and i think that when you find as you pointed out earlier someone who is very very steeped in management of ms we're convergent in what we look for because it is so common the reality is that people impacted by MS are two times as likely to experience depression and two times as likely to experience anxiety as compared to the general population. So for you and I not to ask about those questions is to risk missing something. And we're not about to miss something. And I, and I think that's that wholeness approach. Um, there's a couple of things that I would say is one is uh, I'm struck by what we know about certain stroke syndromes. So there's a stroke syndrome that if you have a stroke in a certain part of the brain, people automatically start an antidepressant because we know you're about yes. to get depressed. That's now, exactly right. the different mechanism of action in a stroke, it's not enough blood to that area, but in MS, that's demyelination. Do we know exactly where that is in MS? Is that part of the disease process? The other thing, and, and Aaron, you can tell me if you bump up against this, is people say, I don't want to take another pill. And I'm like, I agree with you. I don't want to take an, you to take another pill unless you need it. You don't get yep. any extra points by being miserable and depressed. You're not going to exercise. You're not going to eat well. You're not going to function like you should. That's why I'm treating it. All right. The good news is we may be miserable together in the office for 30 minutes, but I get to send you home. And everybody around you is now going to be miserable from that. I'm treating you for myself, but I'm also treating you for that greater the impact that it has on your MS. I think if we center ourselves around making the person successful, mm -hmm. then we can be more comfortable accepting a multi-pronged approach to get there. Right. And if that means that you need to get out of your house once a day to see the mm -hmm. sun, or if that means that you need to be involved in a, a community church activity, or if that means that you need to embrace a little bit of exercise or take a pill, I'm not proud. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not I'm not proud of my goal is not to say, well, we did it without a medicine or my right. goal is to get, to get us there. Right. And, and I, you know, I, I think if we center ourselves with what the goal is, then it helps kind of it kind of helps auto regulate where this MS team is coming from and where we're going together. So so, Aaron, I think um, it's hard to ignore mental wellness and COVID right now. Right. And yep. the impact that it's having. We saw the very first question out of the gate was, how's this going to impact my treatment options for my MS? Right. Am I going to get my Tysabri? And, and for other people, should I keep taking my medication? Yes. All this anxiety above that is unique to MS, but is on top of this, the human response that the rest of us have. Right. Yeah. So how do we cope with that? Now, I will have to say, Aaron is if you've not looked at Dr. Bose. Uh, Boster's YouTube. He is the king of social media. My excuse is I'm older, but I did fire up my Facebook page to try to reach out to folks um, and say, hey, and we did a little humor, right? Uh, we did a hand washing. I actually didn't realize I was being videotaped while the hand washing, but I agreed to leave it up. Um, um, you know, this is talking about, yeah, we're talking about hand washing and I'm tired of singing happy birthday so we can sing uh, Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive. Um, yeah, yeah. And I built a nice one, I think, but uh, on video, apparently not. Um, so we're looking at ways that we can take care of ourselves. 
uh, my mother said that she had heard from a college roommate um, that all her friends had decided they were going to call somebody they hadn't talked to in a long time. Uh, and oh, I like them. That's a wonderful way to keep oh, us all I like in there. When I call my mom, it's a little tricky. I don't just call her anymore. I now FaceTime. Right? It has its pluses, but I can see her, right? And yeah. there's a lot to be saying about seeing each other. Um, one of the reasons I came into the office is because I have two dogs and there's so many people walking the neighborhood now that we never saw before. They're getting outside, they're getting their sunshine, they're cuddling with their pets. Um, that's all, how do you manage that? It would have been a bit disruptive because my dogs tell me every time somebody has walked the yard. But finding those ways, identifying, do I think that the anxiety related to COVID needs to be medicated? Maybe no. All right. Maybe if it goes long enough, we may need to talk about that. And it depends on where your anxiety and depression was before. All right. But that's why it's so important to listen to the tips and the tools to keep yourself safe, but also to take care of yourself. I never would have seen Tiger King if I hadn't seen that on Facebook and people saying, like, you need something to distract you from what's going on in the news. Watch this. And I will tell you, it's highly effective. Um, but I think, you know, that's all mental wellness. That's all, how do we take care of ourselves during this time? I'm a huge advocate for humor, right? And, and people have found great ways to find humor in the midst of a crisis. I don't know if you've seen this, and I'm not sure how I take this. Oh, I take it quite honest, but there's a, an Elmo cartoon, and it says, stay home, or you might have your neurologist trying to innovate you. Uh, we are not real docs. I don't know when's the last time you innovated somebody, but you don't want me in the trenches trying to help you with that, right? And that's, yeah, that's was a, really was a pretty good med student. also saying, hey, um, you know, these this is why we're doing these things. And using humor, even in very difficult conversations, I think is very important. Um, let me it, let me throw out um, a tool that I, I use personally that I think can help um, because the, the reality is that this is a profoundly stressful time. No human alive today has dealt with a pandemic like this. The last time um, we, we saw a pandemic like this was in 1918. And, and so these are, these are uh, novel and scary times. And, and I think it's okay to recognize that. I think it's okay to recognize that there's some, some, some concerns. But I think at the same time, we can make movies in our head. We can tell ourselves scary things which can induce fear, and that's not okay. And so here's a tool that I was taught that I use, and I would challenge someone who's feeling overly anxious to try it. Take out a piece of paper and draw a line down the center. And on the left-hand side, it's an op-ed. You just have at it. Say what is scaring you. I'm scared I'm gonna die. I'm scared that everyone in my family will, will fall ill. I, I'm scared that my leg will fall off my body. Wh whatever, whatever it is, you write all that down. Those are emotions, and, and you're allowed to feel them. On the right side of the page, that's dragnet, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Write down things like, I am socially isolated. I am not around anyone who has COVID-19. I am actively choosing to wash my hands, not touch my face, sanitize surfaces. I am social distancing. And the reason is you can then see, yes, there is the emotion, and there's nothing wrong with having emotion, but there's also some hard facts and, and it demonstrates that you are being active in, in your in your in your decision making to, to, for for your betterment. And, and and that's a tool that I would challenge anyone to do just to kind of help level set. Now I'm going to do something I've never done on a live stream before. I'm going to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Y'all can talk amongst yourselves, well, and I'll be right okay. back. I'm so sorry. Uh, that might be TMI, um, but anyway. So here's a uh, but so I love his idea of the facts, right? Because I, I, one of the things I've kind of fed back to family members, friends, myself, when I get uh, particularly anxious, is I am healthy right now. I don't have COVID. I'm not coughing. The pollen's killing me, right? But I am healthy right now. The also is recognizing that there are some fabulous things that are coming out of this. Um, we were supposed to be in Miami today. And, um, uh, Last year, I missed my tulips blooming. And, you know, they go from they're almost there, they're almost there, to they bloom, and it rains. This morning when I went out to check on my tulip, it had bloomed. And I was home to see it. 
right? My, my, my deck would never have been this cleaned off this early in the season. Never, right? But I, and so I stopped and said, wow, that's a positive. I saw the tulip bloom. I photographed it. I'll be posting it later today. Um, and, and it's just that moment. We had time that we didn't have before. I am a very um, uh, not skilled seamstress. I love to sew. Um, 99% of what I make never leaves my sewing room. Okay. Um, but I love doing it. Um, I now have time to do it. And part of my anxiety management was, I don't know if I'll ever need a mask, but there are 2000 recommendations or, or ways to make masks. sew masks on Pinterest and I have time to look at them. And so I've tried to figure out how to make some masks. Um, am I recommending that people use homemade masks? No, I don't think we need to be there yet. Um, but it was another way of me artistically taking a, well, okay, I call it artistically. I don't think any of y'all would. Um, but it's another way of keeping my hands busy, keeping my mind busy uh, and saying, I can use a crafting that I love doing um, and keep myself busy, but maybe in a productive way. I hope no one ever needs to use any of the masks that I have. All right, me. Um, but it was another way of just kind of saying, is there something I can do? Meal prep has been off the chain since we've been home, right? I've got plenty of time to figure out what should we cook. And it's a little different because, yes, the grocery store was out of certain things. So we had to kind of work around that. I've been trying to be a vegetarian 90% uh, uh, of the time. They got really easy when there was no ground beef in the grocery store, right? And so how do we work with the challenges that we have? How many ways can you cook beans? Um, and hey, we found some really delicious ways. And so there are some things. When's the last time I talked to someone from my college years, right? By phone. I didn't text them. I did. I, I had time to pick up the phone. And so I think there are some advantages that can come out of this. Um, from a medical standpoint, Stuart, I see you raising your eyebrows on me. I'm purposely ignoring you. Um, but we started doing televisits um, two weeks ago. All right. Really? And patients have loved it. And it was driven out of crisis. But what will this mean for how we care for patients in the future? Right. I mean, patients needed to drive, needed to take off time to work. You know, they shut their office door. We, I can actually screen share and show them their MRI. Not yep. every visit needs to be done in person for people who drive distance. So we're also seeing the creativity, the resources, the technology has been out there, but we've not been motivated, incentivized to use them. And so I think we're going to go through this crisis and we're going to we're going to remember the bad and there is going to be bad. That's a reality. But we're also going to recognize that there were good things that came out of this. And that is what I want us to focus on paying attention. To. I think there's a risk for a silver lining. And I think you just nailed it. Um, we have also converted 95 percent of our visits to telemedicine. And not only do patients love it, I love it. Right. Yeah. Now, you know, there's a lot you can do in a telemedicine visit. There's a appropriate examination. We can review an MRI. And most importantly, we can game out not just improving MS, but improving the symptoms that, that are caused by MS. But there's a potential silver lining. You know, in this emergency situation, our government has liberalized physicians' use of telemedicine. Because mm -hmm. let's be honest, a month ago, telemedicine was so arduous that it was almost near impossible. You couldn't bill for it, you couldn't be reimbursed for it, you weren't allowed to do it, it was illegal under certain circumstances. And I'm actually hopeful that when the crisis is over, that the American government remains liberal in their, <clears throat> in their use of, of telemedicine. Mm -hmm. um, because I do think that some of MS can be gamed out over a, te a teleconference. Not all of it, but a good portion of it. And so that might be a silver lining that we walk away from with from from this experience. Mm -hmm. And even just today in Miami, I'm not sure how many people, Stuart, you would have had in the room, but how many people have we who had access to this teleconference? And it, is it taped? I don't even know. Will it be right. available in the future? Right. Yes. So we are reaching people in a different way. Yes. Out of necessity. But look at the positives that are coming out of this. And I think that's, that's right. important. Right. That's and I'm, right. Not, I'm not sick today. Are you I'm, I'm, I'm kind of saying, yes, I'm scared. Yes, I'm worried. All right. 
I didn't make that one. Um, but uh, see, <laughs> that, that's a homemade mask. Yeah. Somebody. Yeah. That's a mask uh, made by a friend of our clinic. Um, yeah. And they and they drop these off. And, and to your mm -hmm. point, um, it's not a um, an uh, OSHA approved mask. Right. But you know, and we can sanitize it by washing it, and and we've thrown them on when we had to interact with patients. Right. And I'm so grateful because we couldn't we couldn't get masks from our medical supply uh, chains. Neurology practices are not big mask users. I was told no. if we needed 500, we could order. I was like 500. We never would use five. I can't even afford 500, right? Oh, see if I'd known, I'd brought mine. Um, but I think this is this creativity, and then it's that. Ability for pa patients have been wonderful in working with us to adapt. Um, you know, it's not always the easiest thing to embrace new technology. It's like me saying, okay, I'm tackling Facebook. Did that post? Did it not post? Did it post? Did it not post? You know, with my 20 year old son, yeah, just push that button. Um, so I think there's good things that are coming out of it. And, uh, but we do have to take care of ourselves. And, um, and whether that's, I mean, I think we all enjoyed the first couple of weeks of living in sweatpants. But that does tend to kind of drain you down a little bit, all right? Mm -hmm. um, and so showering, I don't know if it has to be daily. That's been a debate, uh, and I'm going to stay out of that one. Um, but showering, yeah, put your earrings on, all right? Comb your hair. Do those things. Try to maintain as much of your routine as you can, and then add in those things. My dogs were shocked when I pulled out the dog leashes and said, let's go for a walk. They looked at me like, we don't know you, woman. Um, and we've done it multiple times. I'm not going to tell you how many because there's, there's a couple of days I skipped. Um, but we're walking. We're meeting neighbors from the six-foot distance. Turns out we can holler at each other that long term, uh, that distance, and get to know each other. Yes, Stuart. Hi. How are you? I okay. want to move on to the next thing, if you don't mind. What is want, well, so we have... We have probably just one or two questions that we want to uh, bring up with this topic, all right? And then I want to get into what people want to really get into. They want to get into more of, you know, what's going on with them with COVID-19, what's going on with um, their own self-care for this, as well as anxiety and depression, all right? So there's a lot to talk about there, and I'm sure everybody that's online are waiting to get into that as well. But uh, Jennifer, did you have any questions for the last set of topics? Uh, I just wanted to thank you both because I, just as you speak and you give solutions, I have a sense of feeling more relaxed. And all of these questions are questions based out of fear and worry and anxiety. Uh, what if I contract it? What if my care partner gets this and brings it home? Can I sleep in the same bed as my husband or my wife? So as you're you're giving us these solutions and these ideas of yes, we are in crisis, but yes, there are things that we can do to bring ourselves back and ground ourselves some. I think it's tremendously helpful. So thank you. And I know our audience is very grateful for the, the information you're sharing with us. Uh, Jennifer, let, let me tackle something that you just said, if, if I may, um, because I think it's germane on most people's minds. And um, I, I'm someone that finds solace in statistics, which makes me a big nerd. Um, but, you know, just to throw out some very important baseline statistics, 80% of people that contract COVID-19 are going to have a mild cold. Mm -hmm. So 80% of people that contract the virus are going to have like a flu. 15% of people are going to need medical care above and beyond staying at home and, and taking care of themselves. And 5% of people might need intensive care. Mm -hmm. Now, at the scale that we're talking about, at an epidemiologic level, that can become overwhelming. But I want to bring it down to an N of 1, zero degrees of freedom, meaning for an individual, you have an 8 out of 10 chance, if you contract COVID, that you're going to have a mild, a, a mild condition. And I think that's, at least for me, an important thing that I like to keep in mind. The second thing I want to keep in mind, and Dr. Hughes said this rather eloquently very early on, is that the stuff mom said, she was right. So social distancing is not a hashtag. Social distancing is a critically important tool mm -hmm. to limit community spread of a virus. Because if everyone around you has COVID-19 and you're in your house, you ain't going to get COVID-19, right? If you don't come in contact with someone else who's ill, and if you prevent transmission by washing your hands 
and by not touching your face and by sanitizing, then you're not going to contract the condition. And I hope that people find those two pieces of information empowering. I, I know it makes me feel empowered. It does. It helps. It puts it into perspective because we can watch the news all day long and it just builds you up and builds you up. And, and I think people need to hear this. From the you news, appreciate that. News has to be sensational or it's not news. Right. So saying somebody got something and nothing happened is not newsworthy by definition. And yet our whole conversation this first hour was on making things boring. Yeah. Right. And so that's not sexy. And yet that is exactly what we're shooting for is boring. And realizing that the precautions we're asking you to, to, to that we're being asked to make are the same ones we should be making during the flu season. Right. That's and right. so very early uh, in the and in, in, over a month or so ago, my husband had a cold. Now, I wasn't sure if it was COVID. I wasn't sure if it was just a cold, but I didn't kiss him. I kissed the top of his head. It's bald. It's easy. All right. I informed him that he's going to have to sleep someplace else tonight. All right. Um, and those, if he had the flu, I would be like, I don't want the flu. Right. Um, and so I think those precautions um, uh, are, are things we should be doing. Now, I certainly miss, I mean, my husband, um, I'm not from this area, but he is. And so he usually sees his family members. Well, they're all in their 60s and they shouldn't be going and visiting each other. That's been a transition. All right. To say, well, you know, you call your talk versus he just drops by their house. Um, we're not doing that now. All right. Um, so find things to adjust. I don't think they're the FaceTime generation. Um, but they, but they, they do family text. They do text, all right. Um, okay. And they're calling because they never had to call before. They always saw each other. Um, and so just finding things that um, ways to stay in contact. Um, and and I think we all maybe what's very different now is we're very aware. Um, and every moment is special. Every time I wake up and I don't have a fever and I'm not sick, I appreciate that in a way that I didn't appreciate that two months ago. Right. Um, yes, we had hand sanitizer over the, uh, the office and I thought I was pretty good. I'm probably a little OCD now. All right. Um, because I'm trying to protect you, but I'm also trying to protect myself. Well, um, if, if I can come clean, I'll be honest and tell you that I didn't oftentimes wash my hands before I ate. Yeah. Now, that's it. shame on me. And I am doing a much better job of now of washing my hands before I eat. Now, as a physician, I sanitize in and sanitize out of a room by rote. There's, I got that piece down, you know, but but I, I was lacking in washing my hands before I sat down at the table, um, much to the chagrin of my wife. And so I'm, I'm doing a much better job of that. And I think all of us can identify areas where we say, you know what, I do need to spend a little bit more time or I do need to be a little bit more conscientious and those small things can have literally global impact and you know something else i've been doing is just when i'm really really tired i'm more likely to get sick when i haven't been eating right i'm more likely to get sick when i hadn't been exercising i'm not taking care of the machine i'm more likely to get sick yep. i'm paying attention to that all right it was very hard to turn off the tiger king right before see you know the final last one but I was like, oh, Mary, you need to go to bed, right? That's, don't spoil that's, it because I'm not that far yet. Oh, I, I, I finished have, it. Oh, I have to start it. I don't even know what that is. I've got to start this now. It, it's, uh, it will distract you. It's, I'm going to leave it there. Um, uh, and so, the, the, so that, you know, I'm, I'm paying attention to the food. I'm like, yeah, we didn't have ground beef. Well, I was supposed to be trying to be a vegetarian anyway. Um, but then I'm paying attention to the food. Right. It's so it's a little easier when you're at the house to kind of graze and snack and, um, you know, and, and but paying attention to those things like these are the wellness things I should have been addressing anyway. And suddenly I have a whole nother level of motivation. You just reminded me of, of, of a really important point um, in this concept of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. So mindfulness is not some airy fairy concept or some mythical Eastern religion. Mindfulness is the idea of really, really focusing on now. Mm -hmm. And that is so important because you can be scared about what's coming. You can be regretful about what you've lost. But if we can center ourselves and focus on cooking a meal, I mean, really focus on cooking that meal and then really focus on eating that meal. Mm -hmm. Or if you're playing Monopoly with your family, 
focusing on that moment together and what you're doing and not worrying about a movie in your mind about what might happen and not worrying about things that you've lost that you can't regain, that's therapeutic. And that is as powerful as a tool, in my opinion, as anything else that we've talked about today, as we as a, as a community, as a group of people that are all uh, sharing something similar, try to, try to get through this time. Um, you just made me think about that. So, you know, it's interesting. So when I saw the topic brain health, I, I, I think both of us kind of skipped it a little bit because what do we mean by brain health? Is it doing Sudoku or however you say that word every day? Is it something you pay for online that you do um, exercises to kind of help? Or is it what we're talking about? Mindfulness, exercising, watching your diet, taking care of your machine. Um, and so I think that all is incorporated into what we mean by brain health. Mm -hmm. I can assure you 10 years, uh, three years ago, I wasn't talking about meditation. I was not talking about yoga. I wasn't doing yoga, right? But what is the common connection with all that? Is the mindfulness, the, the, the healthier the brain. And so we are focusing on that. We have flyers on, on meditation all over the office. And I actually have those apps and I actually have used those apps. And maybe now I've been able to, you know, I restarted my morning yoga routine. It doesn't look like yoga to anybody else, but it's yoga. All right. And it's so helpful with my anxiety. It's so helpful with that doesn't look like yoga either. Um, <laughs> with my ability to focus on what do I actually need to accomplish today? Um, and to put away. So instead of turning over in the bed, and I, I have to admit, it's a very bad habit, turning on and turning the news on, right? And it's like, see, what happened last night? Well, bad things happened last night. I don't need to turn it on to know that. But I can take that moment to center myself, to have that moment to how am I going to start this day right? That is brain health. All right. That is all a very important components of that. And I think when we've talked about taking care of the machine, exercising, eating right, working on identifying your depression and your anxiety, and yes, being on what is most appropriate for your MS, disease and symptoms, those are all brain health. Um, and it's, it's sometimes it's not sexy. I wish I could package that and put that in a pill and then you could take the brain health pill. Um, and it would be my retirement plan actually. Um, but these are all components about what are we talking about doing? Um, we are social distancing, but we are not talking about isolating ourselves from society. We may need to find different ways to reach out. We may need to try FaceTime. Uh, or Zoom. We actually have a, a men's group. We don't call it a support group because men don't like that. Um, but we have a men's group that meets uh, once a month on a Thursday. We didn't cancel it. They did it through Zoom. Um, yeah. And actually, people who might have missed it were able to, to be there. Now, I think there's something very important about being in the same room with folks. I'm not telling anybody that this is how I want all of us to live our lives, a camera distance away from each other. But that mindfulness to say, hey, this is very important. This is a great time for us to get together, and we're going to continue that. My sister did a book, a virtual book club meeting last night, and she said right. it went well. I mean, so it's thinking about ways to, how do we still make those human connections? I'm, I'm a hugger, and in the office, I found myself doing this because I don't need to be hugging folks. I can hug my dog, my other dog, my husband, when he's behaving, the son. I mean, you know, and so I'm finding ways to kind of express that in different ways. Um, I think that's part of what people are doing when they're making masks for us. There, is they're making that as a gift to be able to um, send to say thank you. Right. People are doing all these things. We're expressing gratefulness in ways that we have not in the past. And we're recognizing that we're grateful for things. And so the terminology brain health, to me, incorporates all those conversations we've been having all this time. And, yep. and we all need to kind of do a little bit of a, a check-in with ourselves. And, and there are some who will say, I've got my exercise and coverage. I haven't missed that. And some of us will have to say, eh, I need to do a little more, all right? And some will say, well, you know, a lack of ground beef in the grocery store didn't bother me because I'm not eating ground beef. I'm eating chicken or fish. All right. Well, then you don't need to check in on that. 
But for the meat lovers in the world, and um, my husband's one, it is a crisis when there is no ground beef in the grocery. He called me to tell me. And I was like, well, is that, is there nothing? There just was no ground beef. Um, so, you know, looking at different ways to do that, um, I think that's really part of brain health. Um, you, you think about um, you think about how the world is changing. This event that we are enjoying at this moment was intended to be live, right? It was it was initially conceptualized as a as an as an in person event, and I, I want to give uh, the two of you, uh, Stuart and Jennifer, some props for coming up with a alternative that let us get together. You know, it's my hope that people that are participating in, in this discussion right now are getting something out of it. You know, they're maybe coming up with one or two ideas or they're going to uh, finish this up and they're going to call a loved one or they're going to practice mindfulness or go for a walk with their dog and maybe not be so scared. And, and I think this is a great example of adapting and of resilience mm -hmm. and of, of the spirit of what we try to do with families impacted by MS on the daily. And this is just an example of that. And I would challenge everyone listening, what is, what is it that you're going to do today to take that a step further? Are you going to do a virtual happy hour with your friends from work where you're all on FaceTime with a, a beverage of choice? I mean, are you going to play, uh, are you going to sit at the table with your family and do a puzzle? You know, and, and I would love to hear from folks um, through social media, what, it, what have they chosen to do? Because, because, I find that, again, to be empowering. So, and, and by the way, guys, at MS Views and News, thank you for making this a reality and not canceling it and coming up with a way to, to connect. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. So let's go into the last grouping of topics, all right? Um, the last grouping of, of talk here, okay? So because this is going to really take up a lot of time. All right, so we have, obviously, we're going to talk about coronavirus COVID-19, okay? Um, we're going to speak about, I would like you guys to speak about the uh, self-care for people living with multiple sclerosis and their care partners, as well as coping with anxiety, depression, and feelings of loneliness in this uncertain time. So if you can talk about this, it might help with what you discuss to, to parlay on, or if that's even the right word, on a lot of the questions that are being asked already, because we have, I mean, we have so much on paper and what people have previously asked, but the questions are really mounting up in the uh, in the queue that are all related to this. And before we get into that, there are some people that are asking why they're muted. Well, they because we don't have it so the audience can speak. If you have something to write, if you have a question, please type it in on the side and we'll try to you know get that verbalized. And also for those that are saying thanks and showing their appreciation for the doctors and what we did today before we get to the very end i want to say thank you for saying that as well so let's let the doctors now speak okay. dr hughes would you like to start it off or shall i kick it off i think in and i actually think we've kind of touched on these topics and we i have. might argue that maybe let's hear the questions that uh, that we haven't touched on okay that's and great yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. that gives us a framework Mm -hmm. I've got I've got some questions about vaccines. Uh, mm -hmm. Person Maybe living with us uh, wants to know if they should have their flu vaccine and if a vaccine makes them less or more uh, susceptible to contracting coronavirus. All right. mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll be happy to touch on that. Um, the the conceptually the way that you make a vaccine is is you take a strain of a virus and you smash it up in a blender and you got little virus pieces that are dead, and then you inject that into the human body, and the human immune system sees those pieces and then builds an arsenal against it. So if you see that virus a second time, your immune system is primed and ready to whoop on it. And when we talk about a flu vaccine, we're talking about influenza A, which is the most common flu virus that makes people feel like they have the flu. And, and each year we develop a new vaccine based on last year's strains. That is going to protect us from this year if there's another strain of influenza A. Now, influenza is not the only virus that makes people feel like they have a cold. There are other families of viruses besides the influenza family. 
there's a very large family of viruses called the coronavirus family. And there are hundreds of coronaviruses. And some of these coronaviruses only affect a species of animal, like they only affect like a bat or a dog, and they don't get human sick. And there are other coronaviruses that, that infect humans and cause a cold. Many people, in fact, the majority of humans watching this have had a coronavirus in the past. They had the croup and they went on for a week or two and they got over it. And vaccinating against influenza family viruses does not protect you against coronaviruses. Now, there are profound international efforts as we speak throughout the globe working on coming up with a vaccine for coronavirus, but we don't have one yet. There's actually investigations literally going on this moment trying to develop a vaccination for coronavirus, but at present we don't have it. So the short answer is, should you have a flu vaccine? Yeah. Um, you know, most people with MS benefit from having a flu vaccine. There are exceptions to every rule, but that is a separate comment from will it protect me from coronavirus? Because it won't. Now, is it a good idea? Yeah, it's still a good idea. Okay. And so I think uh, the only thing I would add to that is um, people are very often concerned about if they get the flu vaccine, it's it kind of, in some ways, a little bit counterintuitive. You get a vaccination to boost your immune system, but you have MS and your immune system is over already overactive. Should you get a vaccine on top of that? And uh, we've known for many years that the risk of a relapse from the flu is much higher than the risk of a relapse from the vaccine. And so while this still is an individual decision, the standard recommendation is that, yes, you should get a flu vaccine. And if we had known, if there had been a corona vaccine available last year and we had known where we were going to be this year, we would have all taken the coronavirus vaccine. Right. Um, and uh, and we've been very upset with those who did not because they were putting us at an increased risk. The challenge with the vaccinations is we can't predict next year. And so when people will say, well, last year was a really mild flu, so I'm not going to get it this year. Um, you're not that psychic. And so um, should you get the flu vaccine unless there's a specific reason why you should not? Yes. All right. If there is a coronavirus vaccine, when there is a coronavirus vaccination available, will I take it? Yes, because I cannot predict a resurgence. I cannot predict what it's going to look like next year. That's exactly right. OK, great. Stuart, do you have a question that you want to share? Well, I have a question. I've got lots of questions. Um, there's just so many to choose from. So uh, what, okay, so let me look at notes that I got previously first. Um, persons persons uh, wanna know if they're living alone, should they be dis disinfecting their kitchen, their bathrooms, their doorknobs, whatever on a daily basis? So I'll take that one. So if you live alone, but you've walked out the door to touch your mailbox, which the mailman has touched, if you have gotten to the grocery store. So it's not just living alone. It's what is your interaction with your outside environment, all right? I had to go to the grocery store yesterday. I had hand sanitizer, hand wipes. Um, there were people, about 30% of people in the grocery store had masks on. Um, and so I think that is where the risk is and then when you bring it back. And so there's a debate about um, how careful can you be when you get, maybe you get your groceries delivered to you. Who's touched the bag? Who's touched the food? In this, um, uh, I will I will give you a moment of my previous anxiety. I um, I sprayed so much Lysol at one point that the dog started coughing, and I could barely cough. And my husband was like, "Maybe we could take it down just a notch." Um, but I think in this scenario, no one's gonna uh, th that unless you're like making people sick in the house with the Lysol. Um, there's better to be cautious than not but also recognizing the concerns about what are you bringing into your home, right? So when I came in from the grocery store, I did shower, I did change my clothes um, because there were times that I was closer to people than I wanted to be. Um, so I think those are reasonable precautions. I don't see any reason for people not to do that. Just don't make people sick in the house with the Lysol spray. It turns out it's possible. I, I think that there's also a value in practicing the behavior. If, if we all work towards 
wiping down surfaces with disinfected wipes and washing our hands after going to the bathroom, before eating, after coughing, sneezing. That's just a good behavior to get into. And, and to your point, you're not living in a bubble, you're living alone, but you're interacting with the universe. And so, so I think it is a best practice, um, even if you are you know, by yourself. Okay, but great. Thank you for that. I, I have a question that I've had oh, over and over again, and it's been coming in over the weeks. If I get COVID-19 and I have MS, will it cause me to have an MS relapse or a flare? And if I do, how am I going? The concern is getting treatment, you know, at that point. And also, just to add, if treatment is uh, steroids, would that be dangerous because it suppresses your immune system? So we will have to treat the individual situation as it merits, all right? And so first, if you come down with COVID, the primary concern early on is, are you having respiratory problems? All right. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not having trouble breathing, um, then I think most communities are saying it's OK to stay home. All right. Yep. If you have underlying risk factors like lung disease or heart disease or diabetes, or I think it's probably reasonable to reach out to your primary care physician, not your neurologist. Right. Because um, I'm not the right person to be the first person you call because I'm going to say, what did your real doc say um, to reach out to them? All right. Um, uh, and be aware of that. Now, the question about what's the risk of a relapse in someone who has MS, who's been exposed or has had COVID, uh, we're looking to our colleagues over the ocean to really ask those questions. Um, we're looking to the Italians, we're looking to those in London and, you know, in, in China and trying to understand what their experience of this has been. And Aaron, correct me if, if, if you're interpreting this different, but we're not seeing that, um, COVID appears to be uh, a very aggressive causer of relapses. That's not even a real sense, all right? I, 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 I haven't, I haven't heard of it in the case. Yeah, I, I'm cautiously optimistic, um, and I'm more worried about your, your respiratory status than I am about your MS status, all right? Correct. And I think, um, and there are ongoing, I'm gonna be on a, a, a conference call on Tuesday to learn more about the Italian experience. And so there, so this information, um, I understand it's very discomforting when we're hearing things change day to day, week to week, stay informed, stay on the, you know, the MS news and review. If that starts to change, stay on the, the, the our websites, this information will be shared. But right now it seems to be that people who have MS are not having a more aggressive course of their MS or right. of the COVID, all right? Now, I'm not going to say go hug everybody you want to hug, uh, but that is cautiously optimistic from that standpoint. That's what I'm doing, what are you getting? Uh, so, so, um, so both of us have been uh, working diligently to stay up to date, um, and and that is exactly my take as well. Uh, you know, another another, a uh, fa favorite phrase of my late mentor was we don't worry about the flat tire we don't have. Mm -hmm. So you don't drive down the freeway at 80 miles an hour eating a cheeseburger, talking on the cell phone and say, hmm, I wonder if my left front tire just blew up. You, you, that's not a conversation, right? If God forbid the tire blows up, you know, Dr. Hughes and I, we're your mechanic and you're going to call us and we're going to figure it out. But But we don't worry about the flat tire we don't yet have. And so Instead of worrying about what happens if I get COVID-19 and if it triggers an attack, that's a double if, I would rather focus on empowering the human being to wash your hands right. and to distance yourself socially and to take consideration to, to, um, to the things that we've been talking about and keeping yourself healthy. Uh, to me, that's being, that, that's being proactive and not worrying about if, if, because it's going to happen that some people that are listening right now are going to get COVID-19 statistically. And when and if that happens, we've talked about the importance of talking to your primary care doctor, of, of, of alerting the, the clinical professionals. And if we see some mm -hmm. uptick of MS symptoms, we're going to telemedicine and we're going to sort it out. And you're not by yourself. You don't get to be by yourself. Dr. Hughes won't let you and I won't let you. And so and we're going to help you. The other thing is our job is to do the worry, right? I mean, and we're doing it, trust me. We're worrying, yep. we're making sure we're empowered. We're, you know, this is really an international response of sharing this information 
uh, and just speaking of like, why aren't we doing this anyway? Um, and maybe this is you know, change or how we care for people with MS in the future. But this is an ongoing conversation. Um, you know, I'm not concerned about a steroid shortage. I'm not concerned about if I need to give somebody steroids, that can I do that? But it's always a risk benefit ratio, right? And that's going to be a very individual. We it's also you. interesting. It, it's also really interesting. <laughs> I, that, you're covered. I got you covered. If we need to cross that bridge, if we need to cross that bridge. Quick thing. One, one comment. Um, it, it's very interesting that there's a discussion in the medical literature, which is evolving daily, that some degree of immunosuppression might help the over overreaction of the immune response in the lungs. Now that's conjecture. We don't. We don't. This is not gospel. But it's a right. fascinating conversation that part of the severe uh, respiratory reaction associated with COVID-19 is your immune system's response right. to the virus. And so there's a theory that some degree of immunosuppression might actually be beneficial. Now, we don't know, but my point is we don't know. And, and right now, it might actually be beneficial to have a very small degree of suppression. Interesting idea. Quick thing about the hand washing. People wanting to know, um, you know, the reasons behind it all, um, you know, how does just washing your hand help them to get rid of the virus? And number two, what temperature of water should they be using? Is it OK <laughs> to be using cold or hot? OK. And the, the, the reason for getting between the fingers and all. Mm -hmm. So if you can just uh, you know, speak about that. And I'll be back in a minute because I've had too much coffee today. Oh, that's fair. Notice so, the women are hanging strong. The women are hanging strong on this one. Oh, yeah. I, uh, Dr. So, Hughes, I have to tell you, I sat here doing the pee-pee dance for a good 15 minutes before <laughs> I went into the bathroom. Um, now, now uh -huh. when we attend medical school, we mm -hmm. literally are taught how to wash our hands. I'm not joking. These are people in their 20s and 30s, typically, who have you know lived their and, – and we are taught – how to wash hands for real because most people don't wash their hands successfully or correctly and, and and dr hughes and many others have done videos to show you how to actually wash your hands um and and you can find them on social media right now pretty readily the the idea is this viruses influenza virus and certainly this novel code uh, 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 this covid 19 virus don't die when they hit a surface so if I have COVID-19 and I sneeze, shoo, I will spray respiratory droplets within six feet of me, literally. And you can actually see videotapes on, on YouTube of sneezes. So don't do that right now. And, and when those respiratory droplets hit the computer screen, the table, the phone, the cane, they, they coat it and they don't die right away. So if you then touch that surface with your hand, you now have virus on your hand. And if you then take your hand and touch the membrane of your eye or your nose or your mouth, then you have successfully brought virus into your body. So one option is to sanitize the surface, right? Disinfect the commonly touched surface because you'll kill the virus on the surface. One option is to stay within away, six feet away from someone so when they sneeze, those respiratory droplets don't hit you. But another way to combat this is to wash your hands, because if you touch the surface and then you scrub your hands the way that we're recommending, you're killing the virus. Another way to help yourself is not touch your face. Basically, the transmission of the virus from sneeze to surface to touch to face, we're trying to interrupt it at each point. And when it comes to washing your hands, my opinion, if you're going to go the soap and water route, is you use hot water and you use soap. And when you scrub, you need to scrub everywhere, every surface, just like Dr. Hughes when we went to med school and they, you know, get the thumb, get the web, you know, they would literally watch us. And, and you had to spend, you know, I forget if it was like 30 strokes, 30 strokes, 30 strokes. And, and, and I would get yelled at by the attendings if I didn't wash correctly. They'd make me do it again. Yeah. So I think just to be practical with it. So um, we're not we're not recommending surgical scrubs, which is what you see on ER and you're all up your elbow. And the Correct. reason singing is you get bored and you're like, how much more hand do I have to wash? And it turns out that's where you get between your fingers, get between your nails. So warm water, not boiling hot. 
okay? Because we don't want you to start having the skin um, soap, uh, but it's actually probably more the friction and the motion of it that is the most important thing of the, the whole thing. Um, so when by the time you sing Gloria Gaynor's uh, I Will Survive or Happy Birthday Not Once But Twice, or there are some other versions, uh, My Corona is a popular one right now, you will have had plenty of time to identify parts of your hands that you have not washed. And that's what we're recommending. Um, if your hands are visibly dirty, uh, you've been working in your yard, you've been working with food, prefer not to do hand sanitizer, all right? You wanna wash your hands after, particularly if you know your hands are um, visibly dirty. If I had a preference between the two, I had a sink here with soap and I had my hand sanitizer, I would rather wash my hands. All right. Um, but I'm coordinating kind of between the two. And so the hand sanitizer in my mind at the house is for those times that I just go, huh, you know, I'm touching the mail. Well, let me just, you know, just a little extra that I wouldn't necessarily do. But I'm paying attention when I'm washing my hands. It's not a rinse off any visible dirt. It is actually to wash the hands. And that's why people are singing these songs. To, trust me. You sing happy birthday twice, you will say, like, how much more hand do I have um, to wash? All right. All right, Jennifer, do you have a question? I have a question that has come up many, many times, and it's not specific to one disease modifying therapy, but people are asking, are they at a greater risk by taking their disease modifying therapy, depending on which one it is? Should they make changes on their own? Should they, uh, obviously, I guess, the answer will be to speak with their healthcare provider, but they're really concerned about their disease modifying therapy, making them at greater risk, and if there needs to be changes made. If I can make a, a quick general comment, or I guess two, um, I have made um, no less than six YouTube videos on those exact topics where I share my personal opinion uh, about the various disease modifying therapies. And, and I would submit for the person who asked the question, it's outside the scope of this conversation to talk about specific named drugs. And the, 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 the comments that I made are not gospel, they're just one immunologist's opinion. That being said, there are a couple key take homes. Number one, please do not stop your medicine on your own. There are certain MS medicines where if you stop it, there's a risk of some drama for your mama and we don't want that to happen. And so if you have a concern, it is appropriate to call your MS provider. And that MS provider, who is your team member, who knows about your comorbid conditions and your occupation and your avocation and all these other factors, can help you figure out specifically what is and isn't appropriate. I don't know about you, Dr. Hughes, but the vast majority of the time I've spent on telemedicine has been surrounding that exact topic. Of course. Is it the most appropriate thing for us to keep on keeping on with drug fill in the blank, or do we need to change the dosing, or do we need to change the timing, or do we need to change the, the level of precautions right. based on when they got the medicine, what the white count is, what the other medicines are, what the other comorbid conditions are, how old is the patient, um, and, and that's, you know, that's medicine. So, so I think that's actually one of the reasons that I um, entered the world of Facebook again. Um, is because I needed to reach as many patients of mine as I could to address these questions. And social media it has its negatives, but it's definitely a positive from that standpoint. Yep. Also Speaking of which, somebody, we had some people asking me if you're on Twitter. I don't tweet. Um, no. Uh, I, okay. I'm showing my I age do, here. I do no. a little. You do a little. I, I don't I mean, tweet. I mean, uh, a small amount. Yeah. yeah. So in this case, so in this case, the two women who don't need the bathroom yet don't tweet and the two guys do. Yes. <laughs> but that doesn't mean we don't know the answers to your questions. Um, right. So I also want to say, just like we talked about, there have been several groups that have come together and have come up with kind of consensus guidelines that broadly speaking. Right. So broadly speaking, no, you should not stop your disease modifying treatment. Broadly speaking, that's how we can talk about the Tysabri and how we're adapting our infusion suites. This has been um, discussed. Um, there may be in unique situations, certain treatments that we may want to hold for a minute. The question, if you were about to go on something for your MS, so maybe next week was going to be your first dose, should you start it now? 
Um, you know, those are all questions that have been addressed. I can point to the guidelines I've, I've published. Uh, I've, I've um, been published, tagged. I don't know what you do. You tag a link to something on the thing to kind of say that. But in the bottom line is always, always speak to your uh, your healthcare provider um, about what should you be doing from the standpoint. Never, ever, ever stop something that important without letting us know. Okay, because generally speaking. There's a reason why you're on this treatment, and we have to take that into account when we're talking about how do we address this. Um, and I think that's where, you know, Aaron's facts and also speaking to, you know, what is actually really happening? What is your real risk? And what are we learning from our colleagues who unfortunately are ahead of us in this pandemic and can speak to what their experience with their patients on these medications? So there is information that's out there. If it ever changes, uh, I will learn to tweet, um, or I will make sure that the people who know how to tweet are tweeting, all right? Um, but using social media has been a very important tool to be able to get this information out there. Um, and we just kind of saying that's what we get paid to do. We get paid to worry. We get paid to ask these questions. We get paid to spend the time saying, what is going on in London? What's going on in Italy? What's going on in China? Um, what are their experience with these drugs, all right? And so uh, we're not just guessing, um, we're using the science behind how these medications work uh, and we're looking at what people's experiences in other countries. Okay, next question. Uh, people wanna know what they've heard about or what is happening if they're experiencing relapse, can they go on steroids, also continue this? Um, they've heard the negatives that the people shouldn't be using NSAIDs at this point in time. Can you uh, elaborate on all of this? So the NSAID question, I will have to admit, it's gone back and forth so many times, I'm a bit confused um, about what the right answer is. Remember, I'm not a real doctor. I'm a neurologist. Um, but I think the bottom line is, why were you on the NSAID, right? That's what we need to be talking about, is whether this is an option. Uh, I don't use an NSAID on a regular basis. And today, if I was hurting someplace, I wouldn't reach out for one. I'd pick Tylenol, right? Because there are alternatives in this scenario. Now, if you have a rheumatologic disorder for which you're on an NSAID and you're going to stop it for whatever, I think you need to talk to your rheumatologist about why are you on this medication. And I think that's part of the, you know, um, this changing yes, no. I mean, to be quite honest, you got me because I don't know what today's recommendation is. Is it to take it, not take it? Aaron, are you up to date on that one? Um, so, as, as best I understand the information as of yesterday, I, I, I'm not... Um, prohibiting the use of NSAIDs when necessary. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not telling people to throw it out and not even say the word, um, but you're right. And, 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 and again, for an individual human, the best thing they could do is to call their, their provider who's gonna have a better sense. Um, you know, the second, the second part of the question uh, about steroids reminds me of a state that Dr. Hughes and I deal with very frequently. Any MS doctor deals with people with MS who are pregnant. And mm -hmm. in the setting of pregnancy, when there's an attack, God forbid, and because unfortunately this can happen, we're faced with, we have an attack, normally we would give steroids, but wait, there's a pregnant state, and then there's a discussion. This is no different. Right. And so in the setting of pregnancy, if you have a mild attack of numbness and you're carrying a child, we might opt not to treat that attack. We might opt to forego treatment because of the uh, of the comorbid condition called pregnancy in a similar fashion if that same woman with 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 uh, multiple sclerosis who is pregnant god forbid was blind it was a fall risk mm -hmm. and, and we might instead choose to treat them because now the risk benefits different and and, and these are conversations that dr hughes and i have frequently with human beings, because sometimes people fall down, they get pregnant somehow, right? And they can have a mess. They and, never know and, how it happened. Yeah, they never. don't know how it happened. It just happened. Well, and so in a similar one, fashion, we can say that we would, would, would like to just re remind folks is, why do you get steroids when you've had a flare? So steroids are, are we know, may help shorten the course of the flare, but it doesn't change your ultimate outcome. So if six months from now, um, you were still going to have 10% of your numbness. The steroids may make you may, may help you reach that 10% faster. But six months from now, steroids or no steroids, you're going to be in the same place. 
All right. So it's not a do or die. You've got to have stroke. Now, if it's a life threatening relapse or a life severely life changing like vision, then we certainly sure want to do the steroids. The bigger question that I would have at this time is why did you have the relapse? Did you stop your medication? Or did you have an illness? Is there something potentially triggered the relapse? All right. Is that fair enough? Um, but recognizing that if you don't get steroids, that does not mean you're not going to reach the same degree of recovery. The only thing is it may take longer for you to reach that degree of recovery. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, person wants to, well, person is saying, if everything and everyone in their home is safe and virus free, is it feasible to allow others into that home environment who are also safe and virus free? Does shelter in no. place and social, <laughs> does social does shelter no. in place, does sheltering place and social distancing still apply? So the, the oh, so no. And here's why: people can have the virus, people can shed the virus, and be asymptomatic for weeks before they actually present. Mm -hmm. All right. So if we said just sick folks stay home, we would miss that whole window when they weren't sick yet but they were carrying the virus. And so no, no, and no. Don't let your guard down. Don't let your guard down. Oh, and no. <laughs> so another person asks that um, her husband, um, mm. this is a person and in Michigan, there, her I husband. Was, uh, I believe he said that? no. Yeah, he did say no. So what? her husband works with uh, hospitals evidently. and. Um, mm -hmm. You know, should she be concerned with her MS and um, or in general, I guess. And then um, she's I think she believed I think she said also that they're now sleeping in separate rooms, uh, sleeping in separate beds. Um, how far distance should they actually be keeping from each other? Um, and should she be very concerned about this? So I, I think that. Certain um, certain occupations might be at higher risk than other occupations. And within your job description, there might be certain activities that place you at higher risk. Um, I, I, without asking Dr. Hughes, I know that she's written several work accommodations this week. I certainly have. And I'll, I'll give you an example of a gentleman who is a uh, IT technician in a very large library. Now, five days, four days out of five, he doesn't interact with patrons. He's he's working on servers and maintaining the computers. One day, however, he works in a a, a learning laboratory where there's a, and, and the library is open and people are coming in and they're using computers. And he has a suppressed immune system because of a medicine I gave him. So he is in a category of risk. I wrote a letter that said that he doesn't have to stop working, but he's not allowed to do the computer lab for the short term. And, and, and I, I use that as an example of an accommodation. I have written accommodations for family members of people uh, impacted by MS. I'll give another quick example of uh, the, 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 the wife has MS and she's at home and the husband is a key worker in the city. He's actually required to work. Um, and, and the way that his job goes, two men get in a truck and they go out to water sites that need to be worked on. And the accommodation that he and I gained out was he's going to only one guy is going to be in the truck and the other guy is going to follow him in their own personal vehicle. So they're not driving together because once they get to the job site, they don't have to be near each other. Mm -hmm. And so we wrote an accommodation for the husband. Um, now, there's other situations where we've said it's not OK to work right now. Right. And my point is, we are here to help you. We are your allies and we can help think through the safest version of what might be going on. Dr. Keith, I don't know if you'd uh, like to add anything. Well, so the only thing is to say, so what are some of the extra precautions that uh, you may want to consider, right? And so are you nuts to be sleeping in different bedrooms? No, right? Um, and, you know, this has been addressed a lot with a lot of the first line folks that are in intimate contact on a daily basis with people COVID. And yes, they are wearing their PPEs as much as is available to them. Um, but I discussed some of the recommendations are that, you know, he comes in through the garage, he takes his clothes off in the garage, he puts them directly into a wash machine, he showers, he washes his hair, all right? Um, and um, 
actually Cuomo got a lot of grief early on because he did some uh, education around sex and COVID. Uh, but it's a real question. Right? I remember I mentioned I kissed the top of my husband's head. I don't kiss his mouth uh, when he's sick. All right. Uh, I think this is the same. These are just saying what are some of the precautions from that? And then your own comfort level. That's an extra layer of precaution from taking the clothes off to put them in directly in the wash machine to showering, washing the hair um, above and beyond what most of us need to be doing. Um, but that said, uh, looking at the individual situations and seeing what's reasonable. Um, uh, and, and, and I think, you know, I would rather people go maybe a little overboard for some of this. And there's a, a little overboard. I didn't say go completely start raving nuts and, and, you know, put them in the yard. Um, but, you know, how do we adapt with that? And so th those are some of the additional recommendations that, um, you know, that I've seen in that setting where you may want to just take a little bit more protection as he enters back into the house. We've already talked about, now this would be very different from the woman who said, I live alone. Well, why am I Lysoling my cabinets? For you, I would say, well, yes, now we know why. It's an extra layer of something's coming into your home. And I don't take that any different from groceries being delivered. You know, somebody's touched that bag. We all need to be cautious about that. Okay. I just want to skirt through a few more questions real quick because it is getting late and I know you guys want to go because I know you have a lot to do today. Um, so uh, you, may, you may have to go to the ballpark or to, the fair or, or, or to the mall or something, okay? Um, but um, one of the questions is, and this person was one of the first to ask, so I want to get her question in. She, um, she is experiencing the MS hug and she has problems She's feeling that, you know, when she breathes deep, it hurts her side. And she just doesn't know how, from what she hears on the news from COVID-19, that if she breathes deep, it may hurt her side. Is there something that can tell one hurt from the other hurt? I think that, you know, COVID-19 uh, causes a respiratory uh, infection. And there are certain classic features to a respiratory uh, infection, which are commonly seen with COVID-19, which are not similar to multiple sclerosis. So when, when I'm thinking about a respiratory infection like COVID-19, I'm thinking about cough, shortness of breath, and fever. So if you have an MS hug and you're having a spasm of the intercostal muscles causing it feel like you're being crushed or squeezed, that can hurt when you take a deep breath. But I'm going to ask, are you febrile? Are you short of breath or does it just hurt when you breathe? And are you coughing? And I would expect that those are not the same answers. And so if you are concerned, holler at your provider, you know, ask them. But 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 I, I really look for the, those homework of those three things when I'm trying to think about a respiratory uh, infection. OK, what he said. yes. Are you saying what he said? What do you say? Okay. Next thing, um, would taking allergy pills have a positive or negative effect on lung capacity with CV concerns? I think it would be neutral. Um, yeah. I don't think that, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any evidence that taking allergy medicine um, affects your lung capacity. Um, and uh, I would have no, you know, no, no concerns about that. Okay, Jennifer, yeah, you raised your hand. I have a question from Instagram. Someone's asking um, if I am on IVIG treatment, how does that affect or impact my immune system for everything that's going on today? Well, you may have a step up <laughs> because IVIG is actually giving you antibodies. Um, in some settings, what we're doing is we're giving you antibodies to block the antibodies that your body is making abnormally, right? But in this setting, having additional antibodies may actually be protective. And there's been some discussion about if there is a if someone were to get sick who was on immunosuppressant, what could we do for them or what should we maybe consider? And IVIG is one of the ideas um, that is being bandied around. So for my IVIG patients, I'm like, you, you know, you, you're getting a little icing on the cake. I, I almost want a little bit of your IVIG right about now. Okay. I, 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 um, I personally am not stopping IVIG treatments, and I share Dr. Hughes's opinion that of all the different medicines, that that might actually be of a benefit to the individual. Okay. okay. Great. Vitamin C supplementation should they 
People want to know if they should take to vamp up their immune system. Yeah. So, okay. so I, you know, we have to separate um, uh, solid medical facts from marketing, right? Mm -hmm. And and there is not. First of all, people with MS have an overly active immune system. You don't need to do anything to heighten or raise their immune system. That's actually the wrong direction. Um, we do not have knowledge that overdosing yourself on vitamin C will protect you against COVID or influenza. And I've seen some crazy things on social media where people are overdosing on lemons because of some hypothetical changing the acidity in your body. And quite honestly, that's kind of hogwash. Um, and so I think that we need to use a dose of common sense um, when we're thinking about these things. And I personally think that um, supplementing vitamins uh, with, with a couple exceptions beyond a multivitamin isn't necessary, particularly if you have a good healthy diet. I'm not personally recommending that you overdose on vitamin C. I don't think that would be protective. Right, I agree. I think that there certainly have been some reports of high doses of vitamin C being tried in the ICUs in patients who are ventilators um, and really in dire distress. In that case, boost the immune system, boost the immune system, boost the immune system, then you can fight off this, uh, um, the virus effect on the lung. But that is not the same as saying that's gonna protect you um, and yes. it may cause more problems. Correct. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, any question? Um, I, you know, I have, I have lots of questions, but uh, someone that works directly in healthcare as a provider, I'm not sure what their role is, but they are stating they are on a disease modifying therapy and wondering if they should continue their work at the bedside working with patients. So uh, I think that depends on what medicine they're talking about. And again, I think that's outside the purview of this conversation. Um, you know, I've made several YouTube videos. There's a lot of, uh, of, of information that can be reached uh, by a, a click of the button. Um, but, but the answer lies in the drug that they're on. Yeah. Um, because some of them we're going to say have at it. And some of them we're going to say no, no, no. Um, yeah. And I think we have to get granular before we can answer that question. It's outside the context of a, of a, of, of a video conference. Okay. Thank you. And there are a lot of people that are asking questions. Sorry, there are a lot of people asking questions right now of things that were asked earlier. They might have missed it for one reason or another. Just know that this is being recorded and we will be putting it up on our page. So you will get to listen to this again. Unfortunately, you'll have to listen to two hours and change of it again in order for you to possibly hear your answers. But uh, another question that came up recently is that for a person that's bringing um, foods into their home, um, is it... Will the cold of a refrigerator or the freezer kill the virus? And from the boxes or packaging that that it, that those food products are in. You want to take that? So the recommendations that I've seen, um, and and I, you know, I told you I went to the grocery store yesterday. So what did I do? Um, when I got the food home, I uh, sprayed. Even before I brought it into my house, I Lysol the plastic bags that they were in. If you're using cloth bags, then I would have taken the food out of a cloth bag and threw it into the wash machine and washed it. Um, I'm not aware of uh, you know, saying that the, the refrigerator is enough to, clear, to, to kill the virus. Um, but I'm also just paying attention to food prep. So I generally wash my vegetables before I eat them. I will definitely wash my vegetables before I eat them. Um, the question around um, food deliveries uh, is taking it out of the container, uh, putting it in another container, even if it's already warm, maybe microwaving it so it's a little bit warmer, all right, and then hand sanitize because you've touched that container that somebody else has touched. And so those are the things that I would do, um, and I think they're just reasonable accommodations. Okay. okay. What she said. What she said. Now, for everybody also to know is that when they're at their own kitchen sink, you know, they may have touched products from the outside and they touch their sink to turn it on. They should also disinfect their sink. Correct. So I, I approach it like I approach salmonella. Right. I'm pretty aggressive about I don't want salmonella. And so I spray my kitchen pretty aggressively to make sure that I don't have any lingering juices from chicken that wasn't cooked all the way or those kind of things. And so, yes, I think you should be sanitizing your sink like you would normally do. Um, and, uh, and maybe a few more times uh, mm -hmm. while I'm cooking, I, you know, I wash my hands more often than I did before. 
Uh, and I think that's it's OK. I, mean, I think those are just little steps that, you know, I don't know if it makes me feel better or if it's actually benefiting me. But if I feel better, that is a benefit. And I'm going to continue to do it. And, and, you know, these are not recommendations um, because we think they're fun or, or because we're trying to be overly cautious. This is actually very serious. And these small maneuvers m might save a life. Uh, they, they, these small maneuvers can have a major impact. And so if there's a time to be a little bit overly clean, now is that time. Yeah. If there's ever okay. such a thing. Jennifer, any questions? You know, I, I'm looking at our questions and I feel like we've covered all of these questions. It's, it's you know, people are asking about mental health and we've, we've discussed it. And I think that we've done a good job kind of really touching on all of these concerns, the anxieties. Um, and, you know, we thank you for this. This has been wonderful. I don't, I don't want to be repetitive in the questions. And I think we've really covered a lot of material. So Great, thank you for that. Let me throw out, if, if people are watching this right now and they found this helpful, send it out on their social media. You know, let other people know that they should come check this out. You know, if, if you're watching and you think this was useful, send a link to your friend or, you know, or, or, or tell a loved one to check this out because that's another way to empower people. You know, that's another way to help uh, facilitate community. And one of the values of doing something virtual like this is the is the evergreen nature of it that that you know when when MSVs and News puts that out they can turn around and share it with someone and so if you think this was something useful you know send it to your auntie you know or, or let your cousin know about it or tell your friend about it. Thank so you. So for so for everybody, I just want to say this was a fabulous program. The reviews, the thanks, the applause that we're getting from people that that watch this. I'm sorry if we did not get to answer some of your questions out there. I did say from the beginning that uh, that there, we just have too many questions. We would be able to, you know, I would have to keep the doctors on here for 24 hours. And even then, we would find more and more questions coming in. All right. I want to thank everybody for doing this. Dr. Hughes, I thank you for your time to be here today. Dr. Boster, awesome. Always a pleasure to have both of you on. This is why I selected, you know, we select certain people to do all of our programs around the country. And I'm glad that you guys are part of what we do. And uh, and I can't wait for our next set of uh, guests to be on here as well. All right. And again, I do want to thank everybody that's there. I have to thank Jennifer for her um, her thoughtfulness on wanting to do this series. And let's just say thank you to everybody. Thumbs up. Let's keep on going. Let's all stay healthy and wash your hands. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you.